by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. My friends, it's Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you, my friends. It's gone 6 o'clock on Monday the 15th of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. The Middle East is on the brink. That's the warning from the UN as fears from G7 leaders grow over how and when Israel will respond to the drone and rocket attacks carried out this weekend by Iran. The grim reality of the Sydney stabbings, how the attacker who killed six people in a shopping mall may have set out on a mission to target women. An MP has returned from recess today with, yes, you guessed it, Rwanda back on the agenda. But ministers could now consider sending migrants to Costa Rica. And I'd just like to say and apologise. I misread this this morning and thought we'd decided to send them all to Costa. And it's pretty chilly out there this morning. We're going to see sunny spells and showers, but there is a narrow band of squally rain which may just catch you out over the rush hour. All the details coming up shortly. Well, now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The UK and the US have condemned Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend, saying it risks destabilising the whole of the Middle East. G7 leaders say they stand in full solidarity to Israel after Iran launched an overnight barrage of missiles and drones into the country. Iran says the operation was a success and if Israel retaliates, it will respond in a much stronger way. Well, Middle East expert Barbara Slavin says Iran's actions caused little destruction but could have major consequences. It doesn't appear that there was very much damage, so it was kind of performative. Um, but it was nevertheless a paradigm shift because it was a direct Iranian retaliation on Israel for Israeli attacks on Iranians. Donald Trump will enter a New York court later on, making him the first U.S. former president in history to stand trial in a criminal case. The 77-year-old is accused of falsifying business records to disguise hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. He could face up to four years in jail if convicted. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty. Investigations into the Sydney knife attacker are looking at whether he deliberately targeted women. Five of the six people killed by Joel Kalchi were female. The other was a security guard who tried to intervene. His family say he had a history of mental health problems. A minute's silence will take place in Liverpool later to mark 35 years since the Hillsborough disaster. 97 men and women and children died in a huge crowd crush at the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. The silence will be observed at 3.06 this afternoon, the time the match was stopped. And after a lifetime of working in the theatre, Dame Arlene Phillips has finally won one of the industry's most prestigious awards at the Olivier's. Collecting her gong for best choreographer at last night's ceremony, the Strictly judge said, this is hysterical, I'm now 80 and it's my first Olivier award. Hayden Gwynn, who passed away last year, was awarded best supporting actress in a play. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. Can I really compliment you? Because we were giggling at one point there, which is really very difficult for you. Can I tell you a great story about Arlene Phillips? Yes, go for it. It's going to sound really like show busy, but it's not meant to at all. I was yeah. in Barbados about 10 years ago and I got invited to Andrew Lloyd Webber's house, right? As, As you as do. It. And she and I got absolutely battered <laughs> and we were doing the Congo around, the, around a piano at 3 o'clock in the morning. She's a top, top lady, by the way, Incredible. Arlene Phillips. Did she and choreograph your can-can? No, no, she didn't. I can't, can't. Uh, can I just <laughs> say about the Costa story, that's true, so I read it in the way in this morning, it said, we've now, I thought, this government's on its backside. Uh, 
Britain may try sending migrants to Costa. I miss Rika. I thought they were all going to... Anyway, are you, are you going now? I'm off. Are you? Oh. And you're, you're off to, to Costa Rica. You're off to New York this week, Oh, aren't you? yes. Cheeky getaway. Cheeky getaway. You are a legend. We appreciate you on we the show. You Thank you very much indeed. Uh, welcome to Monday, my friends. Hope you had a good weekend. Lots and lots and lots, of course, uh, in the news. The problems in the Middle East, that horrific situation in Sydney. Uh, throwing out there for your uh, involvement, please, a couple of subjects today. Iran attacks Israel. Are you worried... We are heading for World War III. We've sat here for six months and we've talked about this with a variety of experts, many of whom say we, we, we need to be concerned about what's going on, that access of Russia and Iran and China. Do you believe this is now warmongering or are we at an incredibly difficult moment in the history of the world? Uh, talk today at talk.tv, text to 87 treble 2 well, on to our top story today. As Jeremy was talking about, the Israeli War Cabinet has decided that there will be a military response to the Iranian attack over the weekend. Iran fired more than 330 missiles and drones at Israel. Almost all of them were intercepted, thanks partly to an RAF fighter jet that was shooting some of them down. This has led to international leaders calling for a de-escalation of tensions in the region amid fears of an all-out war between Israel and Iran. Here's what the head of the UN had to say during a meeting, an emergency meeting of the Security Council last night. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Well, joining us now is former NATO commander Chris Parry. Good morning, Chris. Now, will we see Israel uh, or their allies intervening any time soon? Well, I don't think so. Um, I think uh, as a result of this attack, the strategic initiative has passed to uh, Israel. And what they can do now is uh, basically hold Iran at risk. Uh, Any time that uh, Iran steps out of line, Israel can say, well, actually, this is our retaliation. Um, the fact of life is, um, we heard a lot of commentators, including the one you just had on, saying, oh, this is just performative. But when you launch uh, over 330 drones, ballistic and cruise missiles against a country, that is not performative. Uh, it, they were all designed to hit something. The fact they were brought down uh, is almost irrelevant. Uh, the intention was to kill uh, and also attack uh, lots of urban areas as well. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty heavy attack, even though it didn't succeed. So, as I said, you know, Israel now has sympathy from the international community. It can get on with what it wants to do in Gaza and it can hold uh, Iran at risk. But, Chris, I, I totally appreciate what you're saying about, you know, obviously 300 missiles and drones coming towards urban areas. It's extremely terrifying. But it would surely have been done in the knowledge that the majority of those would have been shot down. So Iran perhaps using that as an excuse to say, well, we were only attacking Israel within the means that we knew that they could defend themselves. I'm not excusing it no, no, under no, any I, circumstances, but, but realistically, yeah. they would have believed that the Iron Dome would have stopped those missiles. So it was kind of a, a gesture. This is, I think, why some people are, are naming it. Gesture. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to say to you, it's incredibly difficult what Israel did. It's not just the Iron Dome. It's involved uh, aircraft, it's vo involved exo-atmospheric action. And to coordinate all that is incredibly difficult. If we had uh, 330 uh, of those uh, missiles launched against the UK, I doubt if we could bring down more than 10% of them. Um, Chris, I, I, welcome to the show, mate. Always great to have you on. I absolutely get where Nicola's coming from. The point is, in all of this, if we can step away from the horror of that attack, the horror of October the 7th, the humanitarian situation in Gaza, there's a massive political game brewing here, isn't it? We've read yep. that Netanyahu is becoming increasingly unpopular with Israeli people. This will solidify his position by a million percent because they have launched weapons inside Israel. That then gives him carte blanche to do whatever. You've got Biden. You look at Biden, you think, this is a man who's so old he doesn't even know his name. Suddenly, he's in a position where America needs to be strong. Is this going to help him against Trump, who's going to turn up in court this week? Or the Democratic Party, who can't make their minds up how to tie their own shoelaces, are they going to hinder him and make it difficult? I think there's so much going on here. And when people say, and you've said it to me on this show, and we've both been accused of warmongering, that axis of China and Iran and, and, and Russia... 
the world is is undoubtedly on a precipice. And the, all the people who think... I mean, what was that bloke from the... You know, I'm not very keen on NATO or the United Nations. Sorry, we'll probably disagree with that. Oh, it needs to be brought down. How? You've got mad people work. You know, Putin isn't going to listen to you. The people in Iran aren't going to listen to you. I think we have every reason to be concerned, don't you, Chris? Well, if you want peace, you prepare for war. Uh, yeah. And I'm afraid to say the Israelis have said this for decades. If you show yourself to be weak, it's a provocation uh, to your opponent. And that's the situation we're in right now. But the really interesting thing about this is that it's not just about Netanyahu. Uh, if you ask any potential Israeli leader right now what their solution to Gaza is, it's exactly the same. Benny Gantz, who, who's uh, touted as a sort of possible alternative, he said already, you know, I wouldn't do it any different. Uh, and so I would be very wary of thinking that Netanyahu uh, is as unpopular in the, uh, right now in this particular situation as people think. No, what uh, I'm trying to say to you is if there have been voices of discontent, this will be swept away Correct. because a foreign power has launched weapons in... It's a matter whether it's a hole in the ground or, or complete devastation. Yeah. That is an act of war, isn't it? Oh, quite clearly. And uh, and the fact of life is this is the first time that Iran has not used its proxies. Yeah. Now, let me just put that in some sort of perspective here, Jeremy. Iran has had to do this because I think its proxies are saying, look, you know, we're taking on Israel, you know, whether it's the Houthis, it's Hezbollah uh, or Hamas. And they're saying, we're not getting much support from you, are we? And so Iran has almost been forced to do this to show that actually it's got some teeth. But I'll tell you, Iran is not ready to take on Israel right now. Um, no. Until they get a nuclear device at some stage in 2025, 20, 26, and I think there's real delays in that, which is why they're panicking a bit, uh, you're not going to see Iran take on Israel uh, in, a, in a serious basis. And what about the future of the UK's involvement, Chris? Would it be the case that Parliament would vote on whether or not to get further involved, or is this something that basically Rishi Sunak could decide on overnight, depending on the situation? We've only ever voted twice uh, in Parliament uh, to get involved in a conflict. This is an executive decision. Uh, if you think about it the other night, there was no time to recall Parliament to get our RAF people involved to actually help Israel here. Um, and it's not just a question of helping our NATO allies. We would have helped other countries like Jordan, Oman, Australia, uh, if they'd had this scale of threat. Um, as Jeremy said, you know, we're in a a fairly existential crisis right now between the autocracies of the world uh, and the democracies. And unless we stand up for the democracies, we're going to see progressively, uh, we're going to get more coerced, we're going to find our trade that is going to get squeezed and our lives are going to be changed forever. Uh, and Chris, what do you think Rishi Sunak would have been advising Benjamin Netanyahu at the moment? It must be a strange relationship considering mm. what's been going on over the past few weeks, including Biden. Um, what advice do you think he would be giving? What kind of pressure will he be putting on Netanyahu to try and de-escalate the situation? Well, it's interesting. I mean, because there are things you say for an internal audience here in the UK and there are things you say externally. Uh, I think uh, the Prime Minister, as I would say, uh, I would say to ben Benjamin Netanyahu, look, it's your business, uh, but you live with the consequences of your policy decisions and what you do. We appreciate you've got to get Gaza sorted out. Uh, I know, as the Prime Minister, because you've told me, you're trying to eradicate Hamas while uh, reducing civilian casualties. Yep, we can go along with that. Uh, but obviously, you've got to understand what the optics look like when people are getting killed uh, as collateral damage. Meanwhile, uh, you and I, we both know the threat from Iran. Uh, we both know that uh, Iran itself is teetering on the edge because people don't want the sort of government they're being uh, governed by in Iran at the moment. We know the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is at the heart of this. Uh, we will join you in opposing this international terrorism uh, and aggression. I, I mean, I, the, when I started this, I said to you that I think it's a very interesting time in terms of how Netanyahu's uh, seen now by the Israeli people because there's been weapons dropped inside his country, Putin as well. I think it's a very interesting time for the Allies because there must be fear. There's been, you know, a week ago we were sat on this show hearing people across Europe say, come on, why are we arming Israel? Come on, this is outrageous. You won't hear of that now. Suddenly, rightly, you know, or wrongly, whatever, we are obviously going to support Israel. But the truth of the matter is, I wonder how many of the Western Allies' leaders are thinking, oh, God, this is legitimising still further what Netanyahu's been doing. I think there's a lot going on here, and a lot of people will use this situation for their own ends. But undoubtedly, 
that, you know, and, and, I, and I salute you for this because people used to poo-poo you. We are in a really precarious position. And if people don't understand that, they are missing the damn point. I mean, Iran is not going to go away. Whether it's face-saving to show off in terms of Hamas, I think you're right about the nuclear thing. My wife said to me yesterday, we live on the coast. Do you honestly think that bringing a child into a world like this right now is the right thing to do? We've just had a baby. We, if you look around, that's not being ridiculous. That's being honest, Chris, oh, you, isn't it? You and me both, Jeremy. I know, and Nick. <laughs> but you do suddenly think that and you go, hold on, what is happening? But you have to face it out and you have to get on with it. Chris, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Uh, NATO Commander Chris Ter Parry on talk today. Frightening times. It is true. It is indeed. But hopefully we'll be making some sense of yeah. it all uh, over the course of the morning. Well, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now, all covering our top story. In the Times, Israel vows for revenge after Iran's airstrike, but world leaders insist on calm in the Middle East. Absolutely. The mirror step back from the brink, says they, as Iran is warned by leaders of the G7 that its attack on Israel has put the region on the brink of war. And it's time the world faces evil empire in Tehran, writes the Mail, as President Biden blocks an instant retaliation from Israel. But as the ongoing tensions between Israel and Iran continue to mount, what will this mean for the UK? Tell us more, we're joined by Times Radio presenter James Hanson and former Home Office advisor Claire Pearson, who's really excited because we're going to talk about Rwanda. Uh, guys, um, just to start with, and it's a really, I think it's one of the most difficult things you can do on a, on a, on a station, really, is talk about a situation, you know, war, potential yeah. war. Uh, because a lot of people are going, ah, it's a dangerous time. Fact. Yes. And I think all we've been reminded of in recent days is why Britain stands shoulder to shoulder with Israel and always has done. It's been very easy and, and understandable in recent weeks and months to, to criticise legitimately Israel's operations in Gaza. And it's right that we continue to make those criticisms and be a critical friend. But the reason we have always stood shoulder to shoulder with them is because they are surrounded by enemies who wish for nothing but their destruction. And what Israel will tell you is that when they're fighting Hamas in Gaza, they are not just fighting Hamas, they are fighting Iran, because Hamas is a proxy for Iran, in the same way that the Houthis in Yemen, who've been causing chaos in the Red Sea, are a proxy for Iran, in the same way that Hezbollah in Lebanon, who threaten Israel from the north, are a proxy for Iran. And that is why it is important that we do continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel, albeit continue to call out um, the excesses of their operations in Gaza. I'm going to sound like your dad and forgive me. I think I've sat here for six months. That is the finest description of the reality of where we are, I have heard. Is it not, Claire? Yeah, He's dead right, isn't he? Yeah, he I think is. we do have to hold Israel. Absolutely, we have to look at that humanitarian situation. We can never get away from their right to get rid of Hamas after October the 7th. But they are surrounded. And, they, and I, I've been saying it with all... Iran is a dangerous animal, but is it as dangerous? I mean, if you get involved... I don't know, do they want us to get involved? It's a difficult time. I don't think they do want us to get involved. I think this attack really was in retaliation for what happened with the consulate and they had to do something and, and this was their Face something. Saving. It pretty much was because they gave an advance warning. I'm not suggesting for one second that it was the right form no, of, of action. Course, yeah. They gave warning. They said, this is what we're going to do. So everybody was able to, to get people in place to be able to help Can Israel. I ask a really silly question and I'll probably get told off? Um, if you're at war, why do you warn somebody you're about to attack them? Well, this is because of the existence of the Iron Dome um, and the involvement of allies. I think the, the fact that this was warned about, this is what I was trying to say to Chris Parry, again, not excusing it, not saying yeah. it was the yeah. right thing to do, but that is to suggest that as a move, it was to kind of show that they are prepared. It was a kind of yeah. show her yeah. more yeah. of a on their side. more yeah. of a warning shot yeah. than anything else, um, and to show that they were retaliating for that attack. Do on, you agree on the with concert? Nick that but, they would have known that these could have been stopped? Because that was the point you were trying to make of Chris. She wasn't condoning what happened. No, she was of course. saying, were they trying to save face to their own people? Were they trying yeah. to save face and send a message to Hamas and send a message to Israel without actually getting to a point? where people were killed. Well, Israel attacked their, their consulate, right? And Israel, yeah. like, officially, yeah. they haven't even recognised that, yeah. you know... No, they... that's true. But, you know, look, it's pretty clear Israel did attack the Iranian consulate in, in Damascus. Syria. Why did they do Syria. that? Why did they do that? Well, because they would say they were targeting uh, a, a Syrian general... Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, an Iranian general. general, and so it was an assassination, basically. Whereas um, Iran say this is a diplomatic base uh, that this goes against. It is. It's sovereign territory. It's sovereign territory, yeah. and, and this goes against, against the rules yeah. of the game. Mm. So it's very the game. Jeez, I know. You know I'm saying yeah. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about bringing babies into the world. The game, but it's not over the top to say frightening times, right? What yeah. would you say to the people who go, oh, "Shut up, Kyle"? 
your warmongering. What would you say, Claire Pearson? that they need to understand that region and the wider impacts that it has. My son yesterday, 15 years old, sat and looked at me and he said, we're going into World War Three, aren't we? Yeah. And it's that kind of level mm. now that mm. we're at. And I think people really need to understand that these people are serious, they are dangerous and they are armed and they will not stop until they complete whatever it is they see their mission to be. Well, um, as much as I've tried to talk myself out of talking about this, I've just been told we've got to talk about it. Joy, Claire and James! <laughs> Recess is over, MPs are back from their holiday, despite the fact the country's on its backside. And Rwanda's back at the top of everybody's piece of paper. Yawn, yawn, Claire. Hmm. <laughs> I misread. I wasn't even lying this morning. Right. The Times, Britain may send, may try to send migrants to Costa. I flicked off and thought, good Lord, they're all coming away. It was Costa Rica. I mean, I'm being serious, man. Yeah, I mean, the, the place where backpackers go for a year out is... I'd go to Costa Rica for six months, wouldn't you, Nick? Absolutely beautiful country. Yeah, which is why it wouldn't work as a deterrent. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this, this whole scheme True. has just been messed up from the beginning because something can't, all, you know, on one hand be a great place for opportunities for, yes. for migrants yeah. and also a major deterrent to stop yeah. people from coming over to the mm. UK. According to leaked documents, Armenia the Ivory Coast and Botswana have all entered talks with the UK government to talk about third country. As long as they don't include Wales in that, I'll be very, very happy. Are you saying that Wales is a third world country? Probably. Thank you very much. Um, um, Rwanda. I mean, I read at well, the weekend if one... It, it, somebody in the government said the flights will take off. And we've talked before, haven't mm. we? Does it mean, the two of you, I love your opinion, if one person gets on one flight and that goes to Rwanda, oh, be he can tick that. a box. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he can yeah. tick a box. Yeah. Shouting about it from the rafters. I mean, they say they can... They're hopeful they'll have the first flight taking off in June. But what's still not clear is, well, well, what are they actually going to be boarding? Because they haven't found an airline. No, that's absolutely. prepared to charter these planes. Are the RAF going to do it? The same RAF who are shooting down drones in exactly. Jordan, actually doing proper work? Are, are yeah. you going to divert those RAF? To... And the Rwandans yeah. are selling off the properties that, there was, that were yeah. sidelined for. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Migrants. And also, there is that issue that uh, the RAF bases need an enormous amount of investment to bring them up to standard security-wise if you're going to transport individuals. So several million more pounds will be needed. Not on our list. I want to throw this at both of you. I hope Nick doesn't mind. A couple of things. Firstly, Angela. But secondly, something we were talking about this morning. The horrendous situation in the Middle East makes me cast my mind back to things like the Falklands. Mm -hmm. Can you see the fact, certainly in America, Biden suddenly having to be a world statesman, Trump's in court. In, a, in England, apparently, the, the Tories are facing electoral wipeout. In terms of conflict, the government always gets a boost, Claire Pearsall, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. Um, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just uh, saying it's and interesting. And that was going to be my caveat. Yes, it normally does. When you stand up and you look like a statesman and you're protecting mm. the interests of your country and you're helping your allies, it gives you a bounce. However, I do think that the mood against the Conservative Party is so bad mm. that even this is not going to be good enough. My concern is that what's going to happen should the Labour Party get in, how much are they going to be on the same side as the Conservatives with supporting Israel, that I think we need to be a bit more concerned about. And, and now I'm being told off, mm. but there you go, Ange? Ange, the questions don't go away. And she needs to be more transparent. And I think the problem Labour have now is, had she, from the outset... What if she's telling the truth? ...actually been... What if she's telling she the truth? She may well be telling the truth, but we don't know because she's not giving us yeah. the answers that I think... The paperwork. ...are legitimate questions. And had Labour, from the outset, had Angela Rayner said, look, I'll hand over all the documentation, if I need to pay some more tax, I'll pay it, people would have been forgiving. Yes, tax is, is quite complicated. The fact that she's obfuscated from the start and been quite defensive over this has made the situation worse. She probably hasn't done anything intentionally wrong, but we don't know. And until she provides more transparency, this issue is going to run and run. Fascinating. Well, thank Gang, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, James Hansen from Times Radio and former Home Office advisor Claire Pearsall. Well, to Australia now. And the attacker who killed six people at a busy shopping centre in Sydney has been named as 40-year-old Joel Couchy. And police say it appears his motive may have been to target women. The victims include a mother who died, just checked this, trying to save her nine-month-old baby who was also stabbed. Now, Karen Webb, the Commissioner of New South Wales Police, says that detectives are focusing on the fact that most of those women, most of those stabbed, were indeed women. Have a listen to this. Well, the videos speak for themselves, don't they? And that's certainly a line of inquiry for us. That's, uh, it's obvious to me, uh, it's obvious to detectives that that... Um, seems to be uh, an area of interest that the offender had focused on women and avoided the men. 
Well, joining us now is broadcaster Alex Thomas, live from the Westfield Mall in Sydney, where that attack took place. Good morning, good morning, Alex. Uh, what do we know about Joel Couchy? Well, Joel was 40 years old. He's from a small city called Toowoomba, which is about a two hour drive west of Brisbane in the state of Queensland. Um, he recently moved to Sydney last month and officials believe he was living out of his car. Uh, he was diagnosed with mental health problems in his late teens, um, but authorities say that over the last couple of decades, he refused to engage with health services in Queensland. Um, but nonetheless, he was regularly in contact with his family, particularly used to text his mum fairly regularly. I think the last contact recorded was in March. But what is part of the mystery here is why he came to Sydney, what he did while he was here, who he interacted with, and even what happened in the build-up uh, to the attack in the Westfield Shopping Centre behind me here. Uh, you can see how many tributes have been laid down. Uh, and tragically, of course, we're learning more minute by minute about his victims. Alex, uh, welcome to talk today. Really good to have you on. Um, two things here that I want to um, touch upon. Um, you talked about the mental health issues. Uh, it's easy to sit here and go, for goodness sake, the man had mental health problems. What's he doing being allowed to be in society in the first place? Why didn't somebody, you know, family members, I don't know, authorities, she said he wouldn't engage. Uh, apparently stories over the weekend, you know, had knives, they're going to have these knives sharpened and all those sorts of things. Very, very concerning. Always easier after the situation. Australia quite strong on things like that. Is this a case, I'm afraid, a tragic case of a, a missed chance to diagnose and deal with somebody who's got issues? Does it highlight a problem in your country in that way? Potentially, and certainly the New South Wales State Premier, Chris Minns, announced two things today. One, that they're going to look into a permanent memorial to the victims to be placed here at Bondi, the way it's happened very occasionally when things like this have occurred in Australia previously, um, but also releasing, I think it was around 18 million Australian dollars of funding uh, for an independent coroner's inquiry, just to look at all facets of what happened around this attack, the response of the emergency services, and of course, um, what happened with the mental health services. It's very difficult for authorities to put any flesh on the bones, if you like, of, of the motive, because um, while New South Wales Police have been working with their counterparts up in Queensland, uh, they say that despite the diagnosed mental health issues, uh, there was no arrest, there was no caution, no criminal record of any kind whatsoever. I think the most recent contact New South Wales Police had uh, in their records uh, was a mental health concern, which I believe is a relative just getting in touch with authorities say, we're a bit worried about him. Uh, but no suggestion that he would do anything this senseless and this violent. And Alex, we know that five of the six victims were women, the sixth victim being a man, security guard, who, who stepped in to try and intervene um, and sadly died as a result. What can you speak to? I know we, we don't know much about motive, but we know that the police are looking into the fact that the, he may have been motivated and may have actually been targeting women. Is there anything from his history to suggest that that would be an issue? There isn't. I think when we heard from Karen Webb, the New South Wales Police Commissioner, a little bit earlier, she was just responding to reporter questions that there is so much social media video around. You can see how he avoided direct confrontations, certainly with larger men and targeted women. Uh, you're right to, to point out, I mean, every story is a tragedy, isn't it? But certainly the one that's captured the imagination of the Australian public and just rammed home how senseless and tragic this is. Uh, is, I mean, we're seeing now Dawn Singleton, who's 25 years old, and she's the daughter of a very renowned Australian businessman, John Singleton. She was actually engaged to be married to a police officer. Uh, but all the stories are tragic. Ashley Good, who you showed a photo of a little bit earlier to your viewers, 38 years old, a new mother, the nine-month-old baby girl who we know that was also attacked, and she spent her dying breaths. <laughs> it's actually getting to me right now as a father. Spent her dying to. moments taking her baby to two men for protection. And we know the baby was saying the Sydney Children's Hospital uh, had an operation and thankfully is doing much better. Um, but it just says everything about how, despite the wider picture of there being more tragedy around the world and lots of war zones and death and destruction, it's really just knocked the whole community here for six because they can't understand why it happened.
Alex, I've been doing this a long time, my friend. Thank you just for your professionalism and your honesty. I really appreciate you being and on the show the this morning. the emotion that no, yeah. undoubtedly is involved in a case like this. And Thanks, do you know mate. what also makes me so angry, I just think it's worth saying, Jeremy, is how this case was weaponised by some people over the weekend, people who jumped to conclusions about what had gone on, people saying, you know, that they thought that this was an incident, that it wasn't suggesting that it was a terrorist attack, that it was some kind of Islamic attack, which it was not. This was an attack against women. And, in fact, the only Muslim involved in this case was the man, a asylum seeker, refugee, um, who was actually jumped in to try and save the lives of one of those women and sadly died as a result. But an incredible um, report there from Alex Thomas in Sydney. Um, and, yeah, real emotion shown both there and, I think, in the studio here as Absolutely well. Absolutely right. And um, and I think, I, think that's, I think you're right. I think it's really easy to get wrapped up in the horrors of what we've heard. I mean, it hasn't been the great start to the day, has it? You've got the problems in the Middle East. When you hear about a woman throwing her baby at two men who are strangers to avoid that baby being stabbed, you ask yourself, whoever you are, however strong you are, there's something wrong with the world, mate. Either we're not being... Either we're not dealing with these people, either we're allowing them to, to roam or we... I, I don't know what, but... Everybody should just take five and go, wow, Nick, good yeah. words. Still to come and talk today. The 10 things you didn't know about Liz Truss. What well, the letters? As a new book prepares for publication. And His Holiness. Uh, this is why I knew, I knew he wasn't watching this program. His Holiness the Pope doesn't watch talk TV, miserable man. Well, he'll get it online. Well, yeah, he's going to get it there. online. And um, Politics Joe, and the, from Politics Joe, sorry, and the spectators, Freddie Gray, take us through this morning's papers next. Do stay with us. It is 6.30. See you in a few. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to You Talk Today. It is 6.33. We'll have the weather in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Read all about it! <laughs> uh, sorry, Al. A bad back. Uh, Liz Truss prepares to release her memoirs this week. Oh, this will be fun. The lettuce is trying to tell us about her 44 days. She no, not it, much to write about. She said there. it was flea-infested Downing Street, the little flat, and she reckons the fleas were from Boris Johnson's dog. I wonder. Well, just before 7 o'clock, Kinsey Schofield will be telling us all about Meghan Markle's brother's bizarre YouTube brand. Do, you, do stay tuned for that. It is very, very strange indeed. It is, and after the title races in both England and Scotland were turned on their heads yesterday, the legend of sport. Jim will be here with all the sport just before 8. Right now, though, it's weather with the delectable Joanna. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've even Joanna, got some. <laughs> I've even got some pretty good weather. <laughs> Hard working with him. Uh, pretty good weather to come as well. Uh, things are going to improve towards the weekend, but right at the moment, we've got a bit of everything. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, let's look at the temperatures first, because over the weekend we saw 21.8. Uh, but today, the best we're going to see is around 14 or 15, so it's considerably cooler. Now, it's still unsettled and will be for the next few days, but really our attention is drawn to this area of high pressure out towards the west. This is going to uh, affect our weather increasingly, settling things down as we go towards the weekend. And once it arrives, it does look as though it's going to stay for much of the rest of the month and through into May as well. Now, certainly for this morning, we've got this area of cloud and rain working its way southwards. It's a narrow band of very squally rain, so unpleasant if you get caught in that. And it's currently running from the northeast through the Midlands down into Wales and the southwest. It's travelling its way southeastwards, so over the next few hours, if you get caught in that rain, it could really be quite unpleasant. But it will make its way away by the middle of the day, and then we're looking at sunny spells and showers. Now, the showers themselves, these could be heavy, uh, risk of thunder here and there. And over the higher ground of Scotland, over the Pennines, the high ground of Wales, uh, we could also see some sleet or snow above around six to 800 metres. So those showers stay with us as we go into this evening and overnight, but they will tend to die away from many areas, becoming more confined to the Northern Isles, those North Sea coasts, and a few out towards the North and the West as well. As far as Tuesday is concerned, it will be a chilly start to the day, temperatures close to freezing over far northern parts, around seven or eight elsewhere. It'll be a drier day in essence, certainly some sunshine to come through many parts of the western areas of the UK mainland. But out towards the east, more in the way of cloud, and that cloud is going to hang around through much of the day, bringing some rain to eastern parts of Scotland, northeastern parts of England, later on down into Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, and hanging around over East Anglia and the southeast. And once again, the temperatures for tomorrow are not going to be terribly impressive. We're looking at around 14 or 15 degrees Celsius at best. That's around 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Could squeeze a 16 somewhere. But certainly as far as today's concerned, it's the strength of the wind that could be an issue. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you, Joe. Time to go through the papers now with Ava Santina. She's got a spring in her step from politics, Joe. And the spectators, Freddie Gray. Good morning, both. Good morning. morning. What? What? I said you've got a spring in your step. She does, morning. because it's a beautiful spring morning. It is a beautiful Freddie, spring morning. you're going to start with the front page of The Express for us. We've been talking about that. All Corporal Thorpe's in charge today. I <laughs> am, indeed. Uh, world is holding its breath as Israel vows to exact a price. But what price? Uh, well, this is this is the big story of the day, obviously. Uh, I mean, since October 7th, we've been talking about you know, regional escalation. Let's mm. avoid a regional escalation. But, of course, we're not avoiding regional escalation. No. Things are escalating very fast. Um, I think, I mean, uh, the, the story this reminds me of is uh, Soleimani in 2020, when uh, the US killed Soleimani, the head of the uh, Iranian military, then, and there was this great fear about uh, the reprisal. And in fact, the Iranian backlash was a bit of a damp squib. This weekend was a significant squib, but it was still a damp squib. Mm. We were and saying earlier, was it as much uh, a public face attempt? No disrespect to what happened in terms of, you know, uh, you, you did what you did to our embassy, we need to do something to show our people. Mm. Would they have known these would have been shot down? Did they mean to cause more carnage? Was it ticking a box for Hamas and other organisations like that? Is that what this is about? Or, or are we over-exaggerating that the world is in a precarious position? 
Well, it does seem to be that, that Iran just has to save face. Yeah. And it's said now that it's it's over, it's done. Yeah. Uh, Israel saying, uh, no, it's not, we can retaliate any time. Justifies... But, I mean, I said earlier it wasn't very popular. To me, it justifies Netanyahu in his own mind's position uh, over the weekend with what's happened. There were, there were a lot of voices inside Israel saying, I don't think you're getting this right. Does this not strengthen his position? Well, I think it does. And why did, why did Israel strike uh, the Iranians in Syria a couple of weeks ago? It was very odd timing yeah. for them to do it. Uh, and where they're trying to provoke a reaction from... Precisely. Because no-one's talking about what they're doing in Gaza at the moment, No, they? I know. Yeah. Which is quite disturbing, I think, considering the humanitarian crisis. Are we not talking about it? I feel like we're talking about it all the time, as Gaza. we should be. Yes, I think we are. I think since, we are. since Saturday night. Yeah, well, OK, so, sorry. For the last 24 hours. <laughs> but that's the point, isn't spot. it, if you think about no, it? No, I do think we are talking about it enough. But, yeah, I mean, as, uh, as, as Freddie was saying, look, you know, Iran says they're done now, but now it's time for the Americans to put pressure on Netanyahu and say, you know, mm. you, should, you absolutely cannot retaliate. That's, you know, that, that's, it's America's duty now to step in. Does that, put, does that put Biden in a stronger position? Do you talk about all of these countries in terms of what's happening to their election? You've got Trump in court from today yeah. about the Stormy Daniels hush money. Does suddenly Biden, who can't say his own name, on the stage, the world stage, doing this, does that strengthen his position in the United States? I think probably not overall, because his Iran strategy has backfired quite considerably. Mm. I mean, he took on Trump's legacy in the Middle East, which, as everybody sort of admits, was much better than people want to give him credit for. Uh, you had the Abraham Accords and so on. Uh, Iran now is um, in a, it, it's far more distant from from America than it, than it has been. Uh, the Democrats thought that they could sort of thaw relations between mm. Iran, and instead we've got Iran very close to China, very close to Russia, and it's Russia and China that we really need. If we're really worried about World War Three, that's how it breaks up. That axis, okay. It out. Uh, Ava, what we got with it? This is Britain has entered. Oh God, we're back to Rwanda. Well, not quite. <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know if you heard this. I misread this this morning on the way, and I was yep. slightly tired, and I read Britain might try to send migrants to Costa. I right. didn't see Re Rika. I thought it was uh, everybody's <laughs> off to, to work in Costa. And that made you furious? Or well, I don't happy? know. Maybe or there's a where, well, where are we? It made me realise how ridiculous the whole thing is. Right, I think it made him want a coffee. Okay. Yes. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So, Britain... But, but you know... Oh, another time. Um, Britain, uh, yeah, they're looking for another country, aside from Rwanda, that they can do this, uh, this scheme of deporting uh, the people who arrive here on small boats. Um, and a lot of countries have already vetoed themselves because the point being that this treaty is called a, a third country pact. And a lot of countries would not like to be called a third, uh, a third country. One of those no. is Tunisia. They have immediately rejected any proposals. And so have Brazil and a few other countries in Africa. But there was something um, called out earlier that happened, isn't that right? They're talking to... Is uh, it Armenia, Bot uh, Botswana yes. and the Ivory because Coast. Because what you've got, you've got to think is, you know, so, so the way that this Rwanda deal work, works is that, you know, Britain gave over sort of hundreds of millions of pounds and said, like, you know, could you, could you build a couple of spots, a couple of hotels, a couple of hostels, yeah. that sort of thing? We're going to give you, uh, you know, quite a bit of money that you can use to regenerate certain areas if you'd like to. And uh, you probably won't have a lot of responsibility afterwards. You might get sent, you know, 20 or 30 people, possibly... Uh, but it's unlikely. So it's, it's a great deal if you're looking for some fifteen quick cash. million a person. Yeah. yeah, it's a joke. Isn't it's also it? Costa Rica and Botswana are, are lovely. I well, think they'd be quite nice. Well, even Rwanda, Rwanda, you know, yeah. you can't have both those arguments at the same time, can Rwanda, you? Yeah, but I spent my honeymoon in Rwanda. It was lovely. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, so how is it you supposed to work? You spent your honeymoon a... in Rwanda. Yeah. Oh, there we go. How is it supposed to work as a deterrent? But there we I go. I thought it wasn't safe for people. It's very safe. Right. And that's only that's yeah. assuming that people are coming for... You Fred, know, are you going to buy this Truss's book? It's called Ten Years to Save the West. I actually have not bought this Truss's book Which yet. She's serialised by the mail. I think, I think a few she's copies a much mine. misunderstood woman. <laughs> well, I do find the sort of the... Uh, the chortling at... There's a, there's a typical article in The Times uh, okay. by Kevin Ma, I think it is. Um, and it's just the sort of, you know, we've been doing the same Liz Truss jokes for we have. three years now. Yeah. You know, and, oh, she... Xed up the economy. You mm -hmm. know, and, uh, but anyway, the, what are the revelations? That she uh, did not have an affair with Kwasi Kwarteng, which everybody in Westminster assured me was true for years and years and years. Yeah. Uh, she says it didn't happen. Uh, do you believe her, Ava? Well, look, you know, I, if I were her, I'd be trying to make myself more interesting, not less interesting. <laughs> what, you know, <laughs> there are some quite egregious. Do you think uh, she had an affair with No, Kwasi? I don't know, but there's some quite egregious claims in here as well, because she also says that she's a laugh. Uh, in social situations, and you know, I, I, you shouldn't. Who, who vetted this before it was printed? 
Well, quite. You know, there's no fact checking on this whatsoever. <laughs> there's no fleas clearly. in the Downing Street flat, and it was from Boris Johnson's dog. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, for a woman uh, or a, a prime minister to to be as powerful as she, and she had to make her own appointments to get her hair done and her makeup. Can done. I actually just say? That's one thing. I, of course I kind it of is. Say, it's a girly no, 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 thing. No, 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 it's, no, because it's not actually. Because what she was talking about was that you know you're 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 meant to be doing the most important job in the country, yes. and then she was you know I do I do get that you know in the middle of the night she was saying she needed to go and get medicine. Obviously she can't go out and yeah. go and get. She can't pop to Tesco because she's the prime minister and there's no one there. You know, no one there on hand. Can't you send me somebody? And it means that someone who's you know a proper civil servant had to go out and get it for her instead. And I get that. I, 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 I that's fascinating. So you don't have. Well, a PA or somebody who's just on hand 24 7 to go a and go. Apparently not, yeah. It was like her diary manager or something like that. I had to go out and, yeah. It How bizarre. Quite, yeah. Well, somebody outside the door 24 hours a day, go and get me limbs. Well, exactly. Why I waste like 40 million on helicopters? Probably Santina. Yeah, but. <laughs> Run along, I, Ava. I'd do that. I'd be the Downing Street runner. <laughs> <laughs> I know you would. You are. Be great. Right, what should we do next? Freddie, uh, this story on the front page of the Daily Star. Who yes. hasn't watched television for 35 years? Uh, the Supreme Pontiff, Pope Francis. Uh, 35 years ago, he was watching, we think it was Italian TV. It's not quite clear in the report. But it sounds like it was Italian TV, and late night Italian TV can get quite smutty. Oh. Anyone who's watched it knows. Anyway, he saw us, what he said, a, a scene that had adult content. Uh, and he decided, he went back to his room, prayed a bit, and decided he never wanted to watch uh, television I again. I have to keep so quiet. Why? Why? I'm not saying a word, crack on. <laughs> I think it was actually British TV, and I was trying to trying to imagine what he'd seen. No, it wasn't, so it wasn't the Jeremy no, Carl show. Was... Don't even say that to me. I don't <laughs> even care. I wasn't. I was actually going to go with The Weakest Link. <laughs> Anne Robinson. <laughs> I always say, my problem with the whole... I'm going to get into real trouble, but what the hell. My problem with Catholicism, really, is on a, on a, on a totally oh, massive... Oh, wow, OK. Yeah, yeah, we go, yeah we're going I think they should <laughs> sort of look inside their own house before they slag everything else off. Oh, no. What, their own TV? What, what do you mean? There. What? Because of the paedophilia. Oh. No, just look at your own problems instead of passing judgment. Nothing to do with that. But yeah. oh, television smutty. Get real, mate. Why is religion as unpopular in the world as it so, is nowadays? It, it's just one less viewer. But the Bible. That's very stuff. important, one yeah. view. The Bible's very smutty. You know, yeah. if you really oh. get into it, you know, it there's a lot of smut in there. You know, you know, there's a lot of you know theories you could have about Mary Magdalene. That That's why the Catholic Church was would be after the watershed. If I didn't know you better, I'd say you're in a bit of a feisty and fruity mood at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, Jeremy, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. Thank you, <laughs> Ava and Freddie. They will be back in just under an hour. Now, you've been getting in touch with your views and Serious opinions stuff today. That's, that's light-hearted, but, you know, we, we, we threw it out there for a reason. Iran potentially uh, facing dire consequences. Will Israel attack back? Are you worried, we've asked, about potentially World War Three? Uh, Katie Barnsley texted us to say, I absolutely believe that we should be worried about an all-out war and keep ourselves ready while standing by our Israeli allies. Henry, it's not the threat of World War III that worries me, it's the unpreparedness of our military which should fear this nation. And the Middle East has been trouble spot for centuries, says Theo, long before the State of Israel existed, so I don't think we're headed for a world war. Loads to come. Talk today at talk.tv. 8722 is your text message. Still to come, the legend that is Kenzie Schofield, live from LA with all the latest on news. Good morning. Thanks, JK and Nick. Meghan Markle's brother has been blasted for his latest YouTube videos, and two royals have been dubbed the perfect role models for Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. Who could they be? Plus, some of Princess Di's most iconic outfits will go under the hammer at a unique auction this summer. Our favorite looks next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Worm is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to your talk today. What is it? Ten to seven now. Meghan Markle's brother has been blasted online. Oh, my God, I've gone all northern. Blasted? Blasted. blasted. After appearing to mock her in a series of YouTube video rants, a warning, what you're about to watch may stick with you forever. Oh, God. Oh. Oh. Oh, I'm having trouble. Oh. Oh. Oh, it's deflating. Me gain swamp donkey crotch. It, I was just showing off my new my new bump that I bought used on eBay out of Montecito. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, royal commentator Kinsey Schofield is here wow. with us now to try and make sense of all of that. Kinsey, what on earth did you make of that video? Um, I mean, I didn't believe it when I first started no. reading just a description. I had to like, I had to seek it out. And then I, I did it. I, I had to pick my jaw up off the floor. I mean, <laughs> I don't think that Thomas Markle Jr. does himself any favors oh, no. with the kind of content. Uh, now, I, have you seen the follow-up video? video no. Or, or so he has done a follow-up because he's really angry at the reaction. Um, so he talks to Samantha Markle and they did a live. Uh, and I think he fancies himself a bit of a comedian and he mm. stresses that his page is a parody and he's just an entertainer and he's not trolling his half-sister. And Samantha, you know, Samantha says, this is our family. We have a right to talk about our family Everyone talks about the Markle family. Um, you know, the Markles are not exempt from talking about their own family. So, you know, they are really defiant. And, and Samantha feels like people like me, um, you know, so many people are engaging in this uh, glaringly hypocritical behavior, trying to justify what they do and project on others. That's what they're saying about people Spoiler in the media alert. that do pop. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Who's having a go at you? Listen, nobody has a go no, at you. Let, no, let, let me... so she's not. She's not having a yeah, go at good. me, but she's saying there are people like me are mm. are talking about her family religiously. Well, here's Why... what I here's what I would say, and I spoiler alert. I, I don't care if it's Meghan Markle or anybody. The only reason those pathetic couple of people, she started it with some slagging off court case. He's done that. 
that what they're trying to do is make money out of their famous sister. I am not Meghan Markle's greatest fan, but I suspect that all the people who go, why does she have nothing to do with her family? I turn it on its head, look Samantha straight in the eyes and go, I'm not surprised, love, the way you and your brother behave. What an appalling, yeah. honest to God. I mean, clearly hurt people hurt people. And I think yeah. not only are Thomas Jr. and Samantha really hurt by the rejection of, of Meghan, but I also think that they resent a lot of the attention they receive. But like I said, this is not helping your case. If you want positive attention, I would, you know, I look like an idiot because two weeks ago I said on your show, they should just start a YouTube channel. You know, if they, you know, and then we see, We've seen the YouTube channel, so you know now I, I take it back. But yeah. I think that they they are um, weary of working with the media. They want to do their own thing because they have been burned. If you look at Thomas Senior's um, paparazzi shots before the wedding, but they do need some help. They need some help if if they want to. I think they need more than media help. I think they need help. Full stop, Kims. Yeah, and it's not just um, attention that they're looking for, is it? He's actually set up. Um, um, I think you can get paid tips oh. via YouTube uh, videos, etc. So he's actually should we do that? He's actually profiting, yeah, quite. He's actually profiting from this financially as well. Yeah. Yeah, so he's a YouTube, an approved YouTube content creator. And when you're an approved wow. YouTube content creator, people can give you tips throughout your live streams. Um, and they can, you know, buy merchandise from you. Uh, it, it's, it, it, he has over 30,000 followers. So, like, it, it's, not, it's hard to become a creator. He has been approved as a creator. And people do watch him and tip him throughout his videos. So um, perhaps it's on YouTube, then, to remove his approved status because as far as I'm concerned that kind of that kind of video making is disgusting uh, very quickly Kins Princess Diana's dresses to be auctioned got 30 seconds tell us more Oh, wow. OK, well, a portion of the auction proceeds will benefit Muscular Dystrophy UK, Brilliant. the leading charity for more than 110,000 people in the UK. Um, these are some of the greatest outfits. One of my favorite is that, remember that picture of Princess Di where she's clearly rolling her eyes and she's wearing that yellow coat and that cute yellow hat? Uh, that hat's going up for sale. They say that it's that. Oh, my gosh, I love that outfit. They say that they think that they're going to get ten to $20,000 for that hat. How much? How much? To I'm going to buy it for you, Kins. <laughs> well, oh, sure you will. <laughs> I will hold into that, Kinsey. Unfortunately, we have run out of we time. Love you. Thank, Thank you, Kinsey, you. as always. Well, still to come on the show, as tensions mount in the Middle East, we'll speak to military analyst Sean Bell about whether the UK has been pulled into a foreign conflict. Please do keep getting in touch with your views and your opinions. Difficult times at the moment. Talk today at Talk to TV. Uh, text to 8722. Start your message with the word talk. It's Talk today. It's almost seven. We're coming back in three. Make sure you do. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you about it? laughs> yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning. It's 7 o'clock on Monday, the 15th of April. It absolutely is. You were told today, my friends, we're on TV, on radio, of course, online on your smart speaker. And these are Monday morning's top stories. The Middle East is on the brink. That's the warning from the UN as fears from G7 leaders grow over how and when Israel will respond to the drone and rocket attacks carried out by Iran. The grim reality of the Sydney stabbings. How the attacker who killed six people in the shopping mall might have set out a mission to target women. And MPs returned from recess today with Rwanda back on the agenda. But ministers could now consider plans to send migrants to Costa Rica. And the weather gets a little more settled as we go towards the weekend. High pressure building in from the west. For now, though, it is unsettled. Sunshine and showers feeling pretty cool as well. All the details coming up shortly. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Now for your headlines, it's got 7 o'clock. Emily Rose Adams, what we got? Good morning, thanks, Jeremy. Well, the UK and the US have condemned Iran's attack on Israel on Saturday, saying it risks destabilising the whole of the Middle East. G7 leaders say they stand in full solidarity to Israel after Iran launched an overnight barrage of missiles and drones into the country. Iran says the operation was a success and that if Israel retaliates, it would respond in a much stronger way. Well, former NATO commander Chris Parry's told Talk Today it could have had caused catastrophic damage if the hundreds of missiles hadn't been intercepted. They were all designed to hit something. The fact they were brought down uh, is almost irrelevant. Uh, the intention was to kill uh, and also attack uh, lots of urban areas as well. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty uh, heavy attack, even though it didn't succeed. Investigations into the Sydney knife attacker are looking at whether he deliberately targeted women. Five of the six people killed by Joel Calci were female. The other was a security guard who tried to intervene. His family say he had a history of mental health problems. Well, speaking from Sydney, broadcaster Alex Thomas told Talk Today it's shaken up the community as they learn more about each victim. But all the stories are tragic. Ashley Good, 38 years old, a new mother, the nine-month-old baby girl who we know that was also attacked, and she spent her dying breaths. <laughs> it's actually getting to me right now as a father. Oh, God. Spent her dying it. moments taking her baby for two men for protection. Rishi Sunak's plagued Rwanda bill will be high on the agenda today as MPs head back to Westminster after Easter recess. The Prime Minister's stalled plans to send migrants to the African nation will face yet more political wrangling, despite ministers insisting flights carrying asylum seekers should be taking off within weeks. Well, MPs will consider amendments from the House of Lords after a series of defeats against the controversial policy before the break.
And Sunset Boulevard has dominated the Olivier Awards, winning seven of its 11 nominations. Leading duo Tom Francis and Nicole Scherzinger won the awards of Best Actor and Best Actress in a Musical. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. Uh, Emily Rose Adams, uh, immensely professional as ever. What people don't know about you is before you took on this guy, you, you, were, you were in all that sort of... Did I was, yes. What happened? Blast from the past, musical theatre. Clearly lost my talents mm. and here I am instead. <laughs> You have should you sing been, the news Have you the next been hour? booked for Panto this Christmas? <laughs> oh, no, I haven't. Have, have you? you? No, <laughs> I... <laughs> it's not that funny. It's not that... Have you been booked for Panto? Oh, no, it isn't. Um, no, I've not been booked for Panto. I've done Panto before. I think... Oh, no, you haven't. Uh, yes, I have. Oh, really? I played a squirrel. Oh, really? wow. Third squirrel. What, busy um... in the corner munching on someone's nuts, probably? Would that be fair enough? Oh, wow. There we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no? <laughs> Jeremy, you'd make a great uh... evil person. Sorry? You'd, you'd be the great evil character. Why? Yeah, I've we've spoken very... about this before. I think Mike yeah. Graham and I could be... Um, a the ugly of... sisters. Yeah, the ugly sisters. I think so. Uh, but I'm glad you're a squirrel. Thank you so much, Adi. Listen, um, in the Thank midst you, of Emily. all of the sad news in the world, um, just occasionally, one has to be a little bit light-hearted because the news is not great. Let's just if we go back to our top story. Um, it, it's about that. You'll have heard over the weekend. Uh, Iran, they say, seeking retribution for the attack on one of their embassies in Syria... Uh, sending over 300 drones and missiles overnight Saturday uh, into Israel. Now, these were intercepted with the help of uh, RAF planes. This was uh, helped uh, in terms of the US as well. And it sort of begs many questions, Nick, doesn't it? And we it put does. it out there. Are you worried? I mean, are you going to accuse people who are saying that World War III is on the way of warmongering? Are you genuinely concerned? Angela says, I, I still somehow believe that World War III can be avoided, but the fact that this is one of the most dangerous times cannot be neglected. You cannot negotiate peace with Iran. Israel will never back off and Russia will continue to poke the West. Paula got in touch to say, it's not the threat of war that concerns me. The world has fought countless wars and has managed to survive. It's the nuclear capability of the nations that bothers me. Absolutely. I don't believe, says Oliver, that World War Three is unfolding. Iran felt they had to retaliate because two of their generals were killed. The drone attack by Iran is designed to fail and give advance notice. They believe it's nothing more than a war tactic. But that's what we're talking about. If it's tactics and people are doing tit for tat, where does it end? We'd love your opinions on this, please. Absolutely. Whatever your thoughts. Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8722. Well, everything that happened over the weekend has led to international leaders calling for a de-escalation of tensions in the region amid fears of an all-out war between Israel and Iran. Here's what the head of the UN had to say during a meeting of the Security Council overnight. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Well, joining us now is military analyst Sean Bell. Sean, good morning. Um, can you just talk to us about what happened over the weekend and, in your opinion, whether or not we will see retaliation from Israel? Morning, Nicola. Morning, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I, I, you can't actually start the, with the context of the weekend without going back to the 1st of April, when um, Israelis attacked that uh, consulate building um, in Damascus. That killed 13 people, including several senior Iranian generals. And that attack had to go, uh, had to have some sort of retaliation. So the Iran, Iranians have been very measured in how they've done that attack. Uh, they've waited some time. Well, we were sat on the edge of our seats on Saturday night when over 300 missiles, there were 185 drones, 36 cruise missiles, and 110 ballistic missiles made their way towards Israel. Now, the international effort, America uh, particularly taking a heavy load here, but also the Royal Air Force, uh, managed to take out most of those. I think seven got through. They seemed to target and hit um, um, a Nevatim air base, which is a an Israeli air base down to the south of the country. And whilst that's interesting, it's interesting because that air base is where the F-35 fighters are based, which would have conducted the attack on the 1st of April. So there's a certain symmetry. Iran said almost immediately after the attack, that's it. We've um, we've retaliated from the uh, from your attack on the first of April. We're drawing a line under it. The question is whether that line has also been drawn by Israel. Sean, it's really interesting actually, and and I absolutely get what Nick means and what you mean. I, I was trying to earlier talk about the impact and where this puts the people involved. 
I mean, a week ago, we were hearing quite rightly of criticism from within Israel of Benjamin Netanyahu. Everybody knows what I think about October the 7th. I'm talking about the situation that's unfolded. There's no doubt there's pressure on him. In fact, there were debates in this country uh, whether or not about, oh, we shouldn't be arming Israel. And suddenly Lord Cameron came out and did a 20, 24 hours later said we should do. But you said that what <laughs> happened on the 1st of April, somebody said something an hour ago, would Netanyahu have arranged that because he knew Iran would retaliate so that he could say to the Israeli people today, look, they've done something inside our land? Is, is war, is it like that tactic-wise? Have the Iranians done it to, you know, tick a box for Hamas and say, we're with you? Is it, that, is it like that, my friend? Well, I think the point you make, um, Jeremy, is absolutely right, that we, we see things at face value. Some of your comments from some of your uh, listeners and um, what the audience have, have, have concerned that we're heading towards, sparring towards World War Three. But that would forget the fact that there is some of this about reputation. Um, Iran, for example, um, does not want to start a war. It does not want to provide Israel and America an excuse for targeting its fledgling nuclear program because that's taken years to develop. And bluntly, by the time it's, it's when, not if, um, Iran gets nuclear weapons, that will be the ultimate deterrent against any further attacks by Israel and or the US. So it, it's quite interesting seeing how the players... Uh, get involved in these conflicts. The point you make about Netanyahu's objectives, one of the things that's a bit curious is that he was attacking the uh, Hamas in the south of uh, um, Gaza. He had his foot on the throat of Hamas, yet he took that foot off, withdrew most of his forces and left uh, one brigade left. And you sort of question why from a military perspective. And one of the answers might be that Netanyahu's made clear that um, he also wants to solve the Hezbollah um, issue the same way he's setting about solving the Hamas issue. And if he was to be attacked by Iran, as has happened, that might give him license to go ahead and finally deal with the Hezbollah threat to the north. I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the coming days. And Sean, can you just talk to us a little bit about the military equipment that was utilised over the weekend, both <clears> the <throat> Iron Dome um, of Israel and the involvement of the UK in protecting against those, those drones and missiles? How was the UK involved and how is that separate to the Iron Dome? Yeah, I mean, with the time available, I think what we uh, we should say, it's layered defence. Um, so what you want to do is uh, Israel's a relatively small country Ballistic missiles fly very fast, so you don't want to wait until they get into your country's airspace before you shoot them down. Ideally, you want to shoot them down as far away as possible. And this is where there was an international effort. For example, a lot of these um, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles were actually shot down in, in, in Jordanian airspace, and you can't do that without the help of the Jordanians. So a lot of the layered defence, you've got to uh, identify the targets, track them and then target them. And that's where almost certainly satellite imagery, US international effort. But as you get closer to Israel itself, then you need to have a sort of short, um, short distance protection. And that's where Iron Dome itself fits in. Um, because bluntly, 185 drones were launched by Iran. Iran would have known that they would not have got through. Those drones can are I, like the Shahid 136. Sean, can I ask a question? Because you both said that, and I don't disagree with it. If this is about retaliation and face-saving, how do you explain to the Iranian people that none of it got through and it wasn't successful? Or do you dress it up as successful on the basis of a few craters at an airport? And I'm not being disrespectful. I get what you're talking about in terms of tactic, but wouldn't the people want more or not? Well, yeah, but again, um, Jeremy, you're absolutely right. But you'll be remember that the, immediately after the attacks, the Iranians were saying they had completely destroyed the Nevatim airbase and uh, literally blown it to oblivion. Um, and so, therefore, they were selling that as success. The airbase from which the attacks on 1st of April were done with the stealth fighters we have struck at the heart of Israel's military capability. Well, the pictures that came out, and I think you're showing some of them now, show a few holes that were um, um, blasted in Nevatim, but by all accounts, um, the operations have continued as normal. I mean, bear in mind, Nevatim is three very big runways. It's actually very difficult to take that airbase out. But you can see that from an, um, a, a, an information perspective, both sides are able to claim a degree of success. Yeah. And is that why it's been suggested that, you know, world leaders encourage Netanyahu, who arguably has the ball in his court, that he 
de-escalate. I don't believe for a second that that would be taken to very kindly by Netanyahu. But what are the different options here? Unfortunately, we've got to be quite brief about it. What kind of different actions could he take to retaliate without escalating the situation? Well, two points, Nick. First of all, it's not that they're necessary to retaliate. Uh, I think part of the international community, UN Security Council resolution was all about you, 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 had, you started this on the 1st of April. This was the retaliation action. And why do you need to do more? If he does decide to do more, it could be a, a very surgical military strike onto a, an Iranian military facility, again, providing warning, no casualties, and potentially that would allow a Netanyahu to have the last word. But it is very dangerous risk of escalation should he do that. Uh, Sean, amazing as ever. Really good to have you on. Thank you, military Thank you so analyst much. Sean Bell. Let's take a look now at some of this morning's front pages you're waking up to in The Times. Dominating the news, of course. Israel vying for revenge after Iran's uh, airstrike. But world leaders say, please be calm in the Middle East. Step aside from Brink, says the Mirror, as Iran is warned by leaders of the G7 that its attack on Israel has put the region on the brink of war. And it's time the world faces evil. The evil empire in Tehran, writes the Mail, as President Joe Biden blocks an instant retaliation from Israel. Well, as the ongoing tensions between Israel and Iran continue to mount, what could it mean for the UK? Well, Times Radio presenter James Hansen is back with us, along with the former Home Office Minister, Norman Baker. Uh, James, MPs are in Parliament today. They're back in Parliament. We should expect this to be on the top of their agenda. Absolutely. And we, we had confirmation over the weekend that the RAF was involved in the shooting down of some of these Iranian drones. So we know that the UK has been providing and will continue to provide military and intelligence support to Israel. But I think what will also be interesting is the message that the UK government will be communicating to Netanyahu privately, you know, playing that role that we've played since the beginning of this conflict as a critical friend, trying to urge restraint. Because clearly, as we just heard there from Sean, what everyone is worried about is this escalating into a full-blown regional conflict with the US getting involved. That is one of the big fears at the moment, and that is what the UK and the US and Israel's Western allies are trying to avoid. Norman, good to have you on. Goodness me, it's not St. Patrick's Day. What a jacket that is. Not <laughs> this is my favourite jacket yet, Norman. Ever. <laughs> um, Norman, I was talking, I mean, obviously, the, the, the situation, we know it. We know what happened on October the 7th. We know what happens and is happening in Gaza. We know the standoff between Netanyahu and Hamas. Iran's always been this... I mean, you know, the sponsors of Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis as well. Um, a lot of this seems to be tactic. A lot of this seems to be face-saving. You did it, I'll do it. We'll do a warning, this, that. And where, do you, where do you sit in terms of people are saying, this is a frightening moment in our history? Do you think that's yeah. warmongering or fact? It is, it is fact, I'm afraid. Um, <clears throat> both Israel and Iran are difficult countries which are, to some extent, out of control by the people who are running them. And the fact of the matter is, let's not forget that what the Iranians did yesterday, in their view, was a response to what happened when the Israelis bombed I'm not, Iranian territory. I'm not territory. disagreeing with that, but there's something else. There's a difference between Iranian territory inside <coughs> Syria, a building. Yes. This, was, this is actually inside Israel. So one, yes. what, what I'm trying to say really badly without being, uh, being cautioned is... Uh, Netanyahu, I said it earlier, two weeks ago, was 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 being criticised by his own people. There were demonstrations in Tel Aviv. There were comments yeah. over here about should we be providing arms. That's gone out the window. I suspect to the Israeli people now, having had that land inside the country, that justifies everything about Benjamin well, Netanyahu. Well, Netanyahu will actually, dare Use I say, it. welcome uh, what's happened because it gives him more security. Right, here we go. Then position. jump in with two feet. Did he arrange that in Damascus on the 1st of April to justify what's happened in knowing well, this go, would I come? I wouldn't go that far, but I mean, the fact that uh, there's been no damage, particularly in Israel, and the fact that he's been attacked reassures the people that he's, he's the person to be in charge yeah, at this particular point, you. which is unhelpful, I think, because Netanyahu is out of control. James says that we've been trying to um, ex exercise restraint, and indeed Biden and Sunak and everybody else has been doing that, but he's paid no attention to that. Yeah. He's, the, the Israelis are calling up two more brigades now as reserves for Gaza. If everybody else wants a ceasefire, he wants more troops in there. He doesn't listen. James, what could the next steps be for our Prime Minister? Um, obviously, calls for de-escalation, but could it be stronger than that, stronger than simply words, 
to Netanyahu, could we see a difference in, in foreign policy with Israel here? I think highly unlikely that we'll see any step change. I think Norman's right. You know, maybe a week or so ago, you know, there were there was speculation, you know, should the UK, for example, halt arms sales to Israel after the killing of those aid workers in Gaza? You know, that was briefly kind of discussed. But, you know, and the government since have been very clear they will continue to support Israel. Worth saying that in terms of what we send, to Israel in terms of military supplies, you know, it's £48 million a year or thereabouts. You know, it's not that much when you compare it to what the US provides. And clearly, yes, we have influence, but we don't have much more than that. You know, it's the US who really are the big power here and who Israel listens to. And, and that's my thing. And I'm going to pick you up on one thing, no, because I have to. Uh, you talk, I mean, it, I sit here and we talk about a ceasefire all the time, right? You say everybody wants it by Netanyahu. The reason I don't think there's going to be a ceasefire is I don't think the two protagonists in that war, Hamas or the Israelis, right. want a ceasefire. I think that's the issue. The world can run around quite rightly and look at Gaza and go, my God, this is horrific. It's a humanitarian disaster. We want a ceasefire. I'm not sure those two don't, which is why I'm wondering whether this is another part in a horrible, horrible game where by it suits Netanyahu because, you know, Israel has been attacked inside its own country. Yeah. Hamas's big brother Iran that sponsors Hamas has gone, we're with you. And it is frightening. And then you add in that, you know, Chris Parry said it for months, that triple axis of China and Russia and Iran. And, and it is not beyond the realms of possibility to sit here and go, oh, my God, not in a negative way, in a realistic way. No, I agree with that. Look, the, the whole Middle East is a pressure cooker, mm. which has been boiling for decades, as a matter of fact. And then the tops come off it. Mm. And, and actually, it doesn't suit the West to have what's going on in, in Israel or in the Middle East. But it can't stop it. No. And Netanyahu doesn't listen. And this will play out according to what Israel and Iran want to happen, nothing else. And the danger is that we, as the West, Britain, the UK, the US, nobody else, will get pulled behind Israel, yeah. you know, but we have got no control over Israel. And we can't give them a blank cheque. Yeah, I agree. Is now the time to try and exert some of that control then, to show strong leadership and say, you know, you have to abide by certain rules, rules of war, rules of humanitarian law, which we know Israel has already broken. Is now the time really for our leaders, I, I say our, Rishi yes. Sunak uh, and Sir Keir Starmer to an extent, actually show bravery in the face of Netanyahu? Well, look, I mean, what, what Britain does, frankly, is neither here nor there. I mean, both I in terms so of... I agree with you. We think we're far more important than we are, sir. Um, but we're getting dragged into a war that... We are getting dragged yeah. in, yeah, and, yeah, and, no, and that's the point. We're getting dragged in under Israel's terms. The only country that could influence Israel to any degree whatsoever is America, yeah. and they're not doing it. And, and, there, and there it is another thing. We were talking about this last hour. The Democrats are all over the place, and, and Joe Biden is in election year. Is he, is he looking like a strong world statesman, or doesn't he know? I want to move this. I've only got time because I'm desperate to get Norm. Both of you are right. <coughs> Two things, Norm. Are the Conservatives going to get a bounce from what's happening in the Middle East? I know that's difficult for you I to don't swallow. Think so. Secondly, our Ange. It's not going away, is it? No, it's not going away. I was uh, just talking upstairs, actually, to Freddie and just saying that this is... Um, it reminds me of the situation with Chris Hume because here's a situation which wasn't actually terribly serious, but because of the way it's been handled, it's become far more important and far more mm -hmm. significant for the Labour Party, as indeed Chris Hume's driving did for the Lib Dems back in 2010, whatever it was. And I think it's not going away, and um, she's in some danger. And, and if it is, as you said last hour, James, yeah. you know... Here you are, I made a mistake, there's my... Pa there's nothing to show, I'm not showing, I'm not showing... It's yeah. on and on and on. I've got something else for you, see? This whole tactic we're talking about <clears> in the Middle East, this suits Sir Keir Starmer. He's never really liked our Ange, has There he? is a school of thought that he's always this had slightly Starmer. difficult relations and yeah. it may put her in a box, but, look, I mean... I the problem is, had Angela Rayner handled this differently from the start, this would have gone away. It's never the crime, it's the cover-up. Not <laughs> yeah. saying there has been a crime here, that's for of greater course. managed police to investigate. But it's the way she has dealt with it. And Labour, I think, need to recalibrate and come up with a new strategy. And also, just sorry, Nick, very quickly, mm. if she does go, I was reading this morning, there's a highly likely uh, scenario that the, that the left of the Labour Party would do their best to get a candidate even more on the left to sit with Starmer. These could be the beginning of quite interesting times, and to be fair. And, of course, if yeah. she's done nothing wrong, which, has, which is what she claims, it could have been a very clever thing all along, because eventually she could say, well, actually, you've... Yeah, but, she come out but Nick, she could have she just come, come out with the stronger. paper and not had three months of rubbish about it, to be it's fair. It's interesting, but to yeah. watch everybody lose their minds <laughs> over something like this, I think... Well, the only thing I would say, and you know you and I have our moments where we disagree and agree, if you, if you are going to shine a light on everything other every other party does... Yeah. Uh, Angela, if you're going to call the Tory party scum, if it finds out that you're lying to the tax put man, but it, that's you're a big in trouble. Issue, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. But, but then, as James say, give us your paper and prove it. Well, but they ain't going to let go of the media people. because she won't release the information. Yeah. No, she's handled it very badly, to be honest with you, and I think it's becoming far more significant than it yeah. should be. Um, yeah. I, I think you're right, actually, to say that uh, 
Keir Starmer actually wouldn't lose any, t he'd lose yeah. any sleep if she disappeared. I completely agree. Well, thank you so much. What Claire. a jacket! What a jacket <laughs> that is! James eh? Hansen from Times Radio and former Home Office Minister Norman Baker. Sponsored by Paddy Power. <laughs> <laughs> well, to Australia yes. now. Uh, very, very sad news over the weekend uh, that attacker who killed six people at a busy shopping centre in Sydney. He has been named as 40-year-old Joel Couchy and police say that it appears that his motive may have been to target women. You might have seen our interview earlier with a local reporter and he was moved to tears. He's a young father because the victims included a mother who died trying to save her nine-month-old baby who was also being stabbed. She literally threw this child to two passers-by. That's the reality. Now, lots has been said about should this man have been in society, he'd have mental health issues. Karen Webb, the Commissioner of New South Wales Police, says that detectives are focusing on the fact that most of those stabbed, five out of six, were actually women. Have a listen to this. Well, the videos speak for themselves, don't they? And that's certainly a line of inquiry for us. That's, uh, it's obvious to me, uh, it's obvious to detectives that that um, seems to be uh, an area of interest that the offender had focused on women and avoided the men. Well, joining us now is journalist Sophie Ellsworth. Good morning, Sophie. Uh, police over there have said that women were a specific target. What else do we know about the attacker, Joel Couchy? Well, I wish I was here talking to you under better circumstances, but this is obviously a tragic situation that's rocked Australia and made headlines all around the world. And we're learning more and more about the murderer, Joel Couchy. He's a 40-year-old man. He was living in Queensland. Uh, he was a rough sleeper at times. Uh, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, at a younger age. Uh, and he'd recently m relocated to Sydney at times. He was living in his car uh, and he had this obsession with knives. We know in that attack and we've seen the vision that's gone all around the world that he was carrying a 30 centimetre knife that he was running around stabbing people with. Uh, and just this afternoon, his parents came out, obviously very distressed and spoke about him. His father said, look, to, to you, as in the media and the Australians, he's a monster, but he's my son uh, and he loves him. And But they did say earlier that the policewoman, uh, Amy Scott, who shot Joel Couchy dead in the Westfield Bondi Junction shopping centre uh, made the right move. Uh, a lot more lives could have been lost. Uh, Sophie, I always think it's difficult, isn't it, for parents in that scenario? Of course, it's their son, but he's just he's just killed six people in, in cold blood. And, 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 you know, the gentleman, the guy that came to the help and all those people, oh, right. horrific. Some I think just... that the, the family, actually, uh, of Joel yeah. Couchy, they reached oh, out really. to the police officer, the woman who what ended up sh say? shooting their son dead and, and, yeah. and offered her well wishes because I mean, of how difficult it would have been we, mentally we for her. We completely agree. We can sit here and we can go, Sophie, can't we? You know, why... You know, if he had mental health problems, why didn't society, the family, know more about that? You know, why on earth was he able to have these knives, this fascination? But but all you think about is the victims. I'm very interested in, in your country's response. Your country is is one I admire greatly, actually, but you're quite hard on certain things. It's nothing to get into an immigration debate. But I'm, I'm wondering what the response amongst the Australian public is to this and knife crime and violence as a whole, really. Well, we're still trying to come to terms really with what has happened. Uh, and then there's claims that, that there is potential that he was targeting women. That's yet to be, be determined yet. But you can see of the six vic victims, five are women. Uh, there's a lot of questions that we still don't have answers to. Uh, was there enough security at Westfield Bondi? It's a giant shopping centre. It's one of the largest in the country. It's very uh, iconic location, as you would be familiar with. Bondi Beach is one of the most beautiful locations in Australia and many Brits are familiar with. Uh, Questions are being asked about, you know, how long was the response? How was he able to run through this uh, multi-level shopping centre, wielding a knife, stabbing a baby in a pram? I mean, this is just crazy stuff. And you'd like to think Australia is a very safe country. Uh, you know, a lot of people are proud of this country for being such a safe uh, place to live. But this has put a lot of doubt in people's minds and questioning whether it is safe to just go out on a Saturday afternoon, like many of these people, including this mother who died, uh, who her young daughter has survived, the nine-month-old, 
they were just out shopping together on a Saturday afternoon. It was actually a beautiful Sydney, sunny, sub, you know, sunny afternoon. And this absolute horror was unfolding in the eastern suburbs. It's almost too hard to fathom the reality of what has actually taken place. Sophie Ellsworth in Melbourne, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you being on talk today. Nick, okay. you know what I was just thinking there, mm -hmm. right? I was thinking to myself, so you know we talk about social media, you know we talk about how things are far more reported. Yeah. Did stuff like this happen 20 years ago? Hear me out. Or yeah. is it, and I have to be really careful, suddenly people all across the land, the world, are running amok with knives and guns and weapons and people will say, oh, it's this or it's that. Why, is it, is it copycat? Are people being dragged by other people doing it? Is it the reporting? Is it religion? I mean, it is frightening. You're I just think, out in Sydney having a coffee. I know. I think it certainly is the case that stories like this are far more on our radar nowadays because of the prevalence of social media. Yeah. If you think about it, the videos of this man going through the shopping it's centre fine. were on Twitter. They were online before they were even reported about in the news. So it's it's something that we're certainly more aware I of. I do think but... we also, as a world, need to be aware that there are many people suffering mental health illnesses who need to be dealt with, be that by the society or their parents. Yeah. These people need to be in, in, in Absolutely. hospital. Absolutely. And I think the, the issue of femicide and violence against women and girls needs to be tackled in a very, very serious way and not just treated as another one-off incident, but actually as a... No, no, I agree. As, you, a, a we, were talking, of... we were talking upstairs. You could. It's not for us to, to you know, it's still undergoing, but you wonder... What, what messed up relationships or problems he had. But quite rightly, uh, we will keep going with that. Still to come and talk today, by the way. I mean, in terms of we talked about Biden and the Middle East, Donald Trump becomes the first US president to ever face a criminal trial. That starts today. And Majesty mishaps. According to a royal aide, Queen Elizabeth loved it when things went wrong because it spiced up her life. Like Spice up your life! It's like working on this show, isn't it? Yeah. Ava Santina from Politics Joe and The Spectator's Freddie Gray. Take us through this morning's papers next. This is Talk Today. It is 7.29. Good morning. <laughs>very good morning to you thanks for joining us you're with talk tv on tv on radio online and we're on your smart speaking now you ain't going to happen and eve it me old chinas but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney all right jeremy me old china all Rosie. right oi, oi, treat go. when jk rowling says let's just be honest it's all she's saying let's just be honest when a man goes out and kills we should talk about them as what they are a biological man trans woman it's not a woman trans woman Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong.
Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back to us today, 7.32. By the way, Mike Graham has just messaged me. He's up and about and enjoying the show this morning. That makes one, then. Uh, weather and just a mini mo Jim Jam. But first, this is what else is coming up on the programme this morning. Well, Donald's in the dock. I'm glad you didn't say duck, then. Well, not another thing. Uh, Trump will become the first president to face a criminal trial later this year. That's in the papers next. And the title races in both England and Scotland were turned on their heads yesterday. Talk sports legend Jim White here with his thoughts on all the sport for 8 o'clock. And after locals in Kent complain about an almost six-fold increase to parking charges, at 9.20, we'll ask if the price to park is getting out of control. They need to come to London, mate, don't they? First, let's take a weather with the wonderfully, supremely talented... <laughs> oh, Joe's here. Sorry, Nancy. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Sorry. Awful, awful, Joe. I think I asked for that earlier, didn't you I? Did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah good... get it back. I knew something was going to happen somewhere along the way. The good news is I have got some pleasant news about the weather as high pressure builds towards the weekend. Today, they're not quite so good. Cool, breezy, showery, and we could see some very strong gusty winds as well. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, at the weekend, we saw temperatures reach 21.8 Celsius. Yesterday, only around 15 degrees Celsius, and we saw a cold front go through overnight. So colder still today, but temperatures close to average for the time of year. This is the area of high pressure building in the Atlantic, which is likely to settle the weather as we go towards the weekend. But it's going to take a while, and it won't uh, become particularly warm particularly quickly. So for today, then, we've still got this area of rain with us. It runs its way from the East Midlands through the Midlands, out towards Wales and the southwest. It's a narrow band of very heavy, squally rain. And with that, we're going to see some very strong wind gusts as well, already seen around 60 miles per hour over parts of Wales this morning. The odd rumble of thunder to go with this. If you get caught in that on the road, it could really be quite unpleasant for a while. But it is going to clear through. And once it does go away, we've got sunshine and showers through the rest of the day. But again, where you catch those showers, you could get some strong gusty winds with them. And temperatures, of course, uh, that little bit lower, around 14 or 15 degrees Celsius at the very best. And the showers turning wintry already over the high ground of Scotland, also to the Pennines, parts of North Wales. We're talking about six to 800 metres. And then as we get into this evening and overnight, many of the showers start to die away inland, but they are going to perpetuate in northwestern areas and particularly along these North Sea coasts. It's going to be quite cloudy there with continuing outbreaks of rain and also will keep those strongest winds. And those will remain into the afternoon down towards parts of East Anglia and the southeast. Really quite a gloomy picture for that southeastern corner. Elsewhere, still a few showers around, particularly for the north and the west, but it'll be much drier through many central areas and out towards uh, parts of Wales. However, temperatures will only be in the low teens, even if we get that far. It could just be around 10 or 11 degrees Celsius, but obviously where you get uh, some shelter from the breeze and you get a spot or two of sunshine, that will actually feel quite pleasant. And we do look like having these quiet conditions come the end of the week. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Joe. Well, it's time to go through today's papers now with Ava Santina from Politics Joe and The Spectator's Freddie Gray. Welcome back both. Freddie, we're going to start with a story in the mirror. Donald's in the dock. Not yes. the duck, the dock. The dock. Yeah. <laughs> Donald Dock. What would he be doing in the dock? Precisely, Ava <laughs> Santini. Get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Freddie. <laughs> Freddie's rather taken aback by that. Uh, I'm, I, I'm interested in this whole this thing. This is an extraordinary story. I mean, any way you look at it, whatever your politics are, this is an absolutely extraordinary sure. story. Donald Trump, who in a few months' time could be president of the United States again, uh, is going to be on a criminal trial today and uh, is facing... Uh, this is just one of them. There's four indictments. Mm -hmm. This is the one that might get resolved before the election. And if found guilty, I think technically he could face up to four years in jail. He is going and to be found guilty, isn't he? Because I was reading at the weekend with the greatest respect, and again, not notwithstanding politics, OK? Mm. Um, 
They cut, it, it, the, New York hates him. It's purely democratic. They're, they're going to struggle to find 12 men or women and men and women who, who will be imbalanced in their opinion. What I, what I wanted to ask you was, which goes to the Middle East, really, less about the, mm. the, the court case. If you talk about optics, right, is Joe Biden doing well out of the fact that he's being seen as a world statesman whilst Donald is, 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 is in court or, or, or not? Or is it still, this is ridiculous, you're doing this to somebody who could be the president of the, the United States in six months' time? Where, where, where do you stand on that? Well, I think, I mean, up until now, up until recently, all the Donald Trump legal stuff has helped him. Yes. It's, it's boosted his profile, it's made sure. people feel sorry for him. Independents, not just Republicans, independents don't like it. They think it's grubby going after him, because it is. It's obvious weaponization of the legal system and so on. I do think now, as we get closer to an election, the Democrats' plan, which is that they, they will, you know, they will have, look, here's Biden on the world stage doing all this important, serious stuff, mm. and then you've got this complete sort of cartoonish sideshow of Donald Trump in court. And, you know, interestingly, Donald Trump hasn't said anything about the Middle East over the weekend. He's done a lot of talking, a lot of truth social posting yeah. uh, on the internet, but he has not mentioned Iran or Israel, which is... And what can you tell us about the core of this case? This is about sto uh, an issue regarding Stormy Daniels. So, yeah, so this is Alvin Bragg, who's a very, very obviously biased prosecutor, has put this case together, and legal experts in America say it's pretty thin. He's, right. He's basically... He's put together two minor possible tax demeanours mm -hmm. and sort of put and hedged them together to make it a criminal allegation. Right. A criminal accusation. And the idea is that he had this uh, relationship with Stormy Daniels and another actress and some doorman who knew about the story. And to stop them publicising the story, to stop them talking about the story, uh, they paid them, the Trump organisation paid them uh, catch and kill fees, so they can't talk about it. But they... he filed it as a business expense when he, he shouldn't it's a business have done. expense, and he may it may have come out of campaign finances, which would be a violation. Right, of... I get that. Yeah. But can I get to the other point, which should go down like a lead balloon that I've never really understood? So that doorman and that woman, if they've done what they did or were part of it, and they took the money, yeah, how can they take the money and then say it's unfair? Uh, well, or am good, I missing the point? A though? very good point. I don't think anyone's. I'm not sticking up for Donald Trump. No, I'm no, saying no. that if you if you paid hush money, you want to take a deal. You, can, you sign an NDA, you can't open your mouth. Yes, well, that's how it's supposed to work. Well, uh, but, but then there's huge political pressure on them yeah. to, to speak. Mm. And it was, it was always going to come out. Right, we're going to move on to the next story now. Ava, uh, a story in the Daily Mail about vape shops. Yes, so this uh, is uh, a vote that we will see in Parliament, I think, this week or next, where uh, so, uh, vape shops will be licensed properly in the same way that alcohol... I can't believe they weren't was... already. Well, this is what I don't quite understand about it. So, basically, MPs have discovered that it's quite easy to buy a vape and children are buying them from newsagents and other shops quite easily. And they're now going to strengthen the law on that. But this, is, this is entwined in the smoking bill that uh, Rishi Sunak is presenting to Parliament. And within that, he will also um, do what well, he'll make it so that anyone who's 15 now will never smoke. Um, and it's very nanny state. And Boris Johnson has been speaking about it over the weekend. Uh, he's been talking about how it's, it, it's, it's totally not conservative and it's uh, nuts. ridiculous. Nuts. He said nuts. it was nuts. That's yeah. the word, sorry, yes, yeah. nuts. Well, I, I, I had a pneumonia, as you know, and, and, and I couldn't do anything. And I was vaping a lot. And the doctor actually said to me, um, they don't know what's in them. I can't, I, that, that's me done on vaping. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm being no, completely yeah. serious. I mean, they're quite obviously terrible for you. I think, you know, there, there, there should be an inquiry, actually, into whether, when they were at first billed by the NHS as the safer option to smoke it. We were I mean, encouraged to they, use them to give up smoking. Mm -hmm. smoking. Because yeah. perhaps they are Probably. safer than smoking. But, you know, it, it has meant that a lot of people have... and a lot of children have started vaping because they think that it's harmless, and it's not at all. I do uh, feel a bit sorry for these high street shops because the only high street shops that work now are shops that sell vapes, vapes. or fixed mm. phones. Yeah. Or both, quite often, together. Precisely. Uh, now they're going to be cut off from that. It's the yeah. end of the... The, but the more they look the into life. vapes, the more they can come up with potentially an alternative that isn't so bad for you. Or you know, I know there are versions. But that you're the certainly... same as me. We're, that, we're, yeah. uh, we're encouraged to use them to give up smoking. Yeah, and it mm. helped me quit successfully. Now I don't use a vape at all. But um, yeah, I actually remember one. someone coming into. We were we were talking about vaping years and years ago, and someone actually brought in a vape. They were from a health provider. They yeah. brought in a vape yeah. for me to have. They were yeah. like, you should, you should try this. Is it a good yeah. one? It's, it's crazy. It's not. Oh, God, I don't know what you're going to do. I fronted admit. a campaign from the government. I was paid to front a yes. campaign seven years ago and make an advert that said vaping, and because I was doing it myself, 
um, would help you is, is the right way to give up smoking cigarettes because of nicotine. Think, and you see in there it says ch tackle child nicotine addicts because there's see, nicotine was, in them. But they are good for get, helping you get off of the cigarettes. Yeah. As long it's, as it's, it's not on nicotine, few, though, it's, yeah. it's no tar, is it? Well, I think yeah. it's the nicotine is not necessarily... Oh, look, I'm not a health expert, but I believe, I'm led to believe that the nicotine is not necessarily bad for you, but that is the part of it that is addictive. Yeah. And, that can, and, I, and I've... I've but I think it's the, li nicotine, but it's the liquid yeah. that they put in the vapes that we just don't know about. So yes, the, and the not... stuff that quite mm. often, if you do vape... And as Jamie said, they're, well made, they're made in China, so they've probably got microphones and they're probably taking all your data. Well, not you, them made quite near Wuhan. A friend of mine it. actually makes his own. Who, what? A friend of mine actually makes his own. What's I don't that? think it's safe to do that. Makes <laughs> his own. Be doing it makes Rachel. his own She's pages. got dodgy friends, mate. They all roll their own. What's going on there? <laughs> OK, we're going to move on to another story now quickly before we run out of time. Ava, uh, tell us why the Queen was most amused. Yeah. I don't know. She, where is she? Where you is know? she? That's She's what I want to know. You haven't seen her in a while, have you? And that's very curious. Where is the queen? She's cheap. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> the queen, the queen loved it when things went wrong, apparently, because it spiced up her life. But do you know what was a really fun I little tidbit them, out of um, Liz Truss's book over the weekend? Mm. You know the little snippets that we're we're getting out of it. She was saying <laughs> she admitted to being furious when the queen died because it was so early on into Liz Truss's oh premiership God. and she was furious and she was, you know, she was like, how, how could this happen to me? I've got so much going on as it is. Do you Why know do I have to take on this I burden? feel a little bit sorry for Liz Truss around that because yeah. she was instantly, the joke was she'd killed the Queen. Because you know, she did and, the curtsy and, was, and then, yeah, yeah, and then it... And you felt that was, yeah. I, I, I um... It was bad planning. I thought it was living proof. Um, many have said this about me on television. I think it's patently obvious when somebody is spectacularly out of their depth. Whether that was with the Queen or as Prime Minister, I just think she should never have got the role. But mm. having said that, for anybody who had that role, when a monarch who died having, you know, served this country for 70 years, it was never going to be easy, was it? I Are mean, you I joking? What? All you've got to do you is don't... say how awful it is and then turn up to the funeral. Don't be so disrespectful oh, to the late much... Queen. No, I'm that's not, not disrespectful yeah. to the Queen. I'm, I'm talking about Liz Truss. I'm saying that's much easier than having to... I don't oh, know, listen, yeah, I deal with what's going on at the moment exactly. in the Middle East. No, no, no yeah. I don't disagree. Tony Blair would have loved it, wouldn't he? He would, well, have, he would have made the most... Look, we are weird. not amused by that man from the Labour Party. <laughs> very, very, very left-wing. Is that the... you doing Keir Starmer? <laughs> no, that's me doing the Queen, dear. Oh, <laughs> right, then? That was... This is me doing the but, Queen, right. yeah, okay. Has, has right. the Queen referenced any specific mishaps that she particularly enjoyed? Uh, Freddie? There, there, were no. not, there were surprisingly few mentioned, actually. I could do I a think... great story about the old man who worked for the Queen Mother for 41 years, but I will actually get sacked, so I won't do it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, oh. it's about Dallas. Oh, go on, do it. No, I'm not doing it. I can think of one, actually. You know when she um, she had the cake and the cake was upside down? No? Oh, yes. You remember that yeah. moment? Oh, yeah, with the sword. With yeah, the sword. Yeah. Cut yeah. It with anyway, sword. thank you to like... Ava and Freddie. Oh, <laughs> He's on one. Go on, you can do the rest of it. Uh, like they're that. back in just an hour. Um, do you want to do some of these, do you? <laughs> no, I want to go straight to Jim White because he's here with all of your sport. Jim White's next, ladies and gentlemen. Do it, big boy. Thank you so much. What an introduction. Yeah, it was a day of huge twists and turns in the title race as both Liverpool and Arsenal were shocked. And that leaves City, of course, very much in the driving seat. Meanwhile, stateside, it was Scottish Scheffler who stormed to Masters victory while Tiger Woods was an absolute shadow of his former self. And the city of Liverpool will fall silent later on to mark 35 years since the Hillsborough disaster. This is Talk Today. Good morning, everyone. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to you Talk Today. It is 7.49. Now, Arsenal and Liverpool have sent Manchester City a title gift after both teams lost ground in their Premier League title races. What a day it was. Liverpool losing 1-0 to Crystal Palace. Arsenal losing 2-0 to Aston Villa. <clears throat> their first defeat in 12 games. West Ham losing as well. It, I said this last week, Jim White. Man City have the pedigree, the experience, and just... They're like a Rolls-Royce, mate. They, this is, Yesterday, definitive end of the Premier League title race. To Very me. much so. I mean, uh, Liverpool losing, right, OK, but surely not Arsenal uh, yeah. against uh, Aston Villa. But, Jeremy, that's exactly what happened. And City, as you say, hammered Luton 5-1. You know, it's incredible. They went top, and when they went top, that was the 21st time the lead has changed mm -hmm. at the top of the Premier League table. And you have to think, with six games to go, they've been there, done it, they've won the T-shirt, it would be their sixth title win in seven years. Amazing. So they know exactly how to do it. This is the thing. But Klopp looks a shadow of his former self. This is not how he planned it, of course. That's a lancer and the Europa League was yeah. weird enough, 3-0. Yeah. Uh, Crystal Palace, not as he thought it would be, but maybe that's it. That Maybe that's just football. But to me, Man City just have the... Well, that's it. I mean, you, you have to think Manchester City now, all they've got to do is do what they're, they're very good at and do what they've done in the past. So Manchester City very, very much in the, the driving seat. Even up north, uh, even north of the border, yeah. uh, a shock there because Rangers lost at Ross County. Where do they play? Dingwall, which you probably know is way, way north. A uh, 180-mile trip back to Glasgow for those Rangers players to get it through their heads that they've just lost 3-2 to Ross Lots County. Lots being said for weeks that Brenda Rogers, as I call him, um, wasn't doing a great job. And, you know, Celtic throw away that lead the other day, didn't they, at Rangers at Ibrox? But, mm. um, again, Celtic, if they keep their nut down, are going to win the title. And well, Brandon Rodgers right. will be vindicated. Rangers will get a game in hand. This game against Dundee, which has been postponed because of the weather uh, so often. And they play that on Wednesday night. But at the moment, this Monday morning, Celtic four clear at the top. Rangers yeah. win, of course, on Wednesday. But, you know, that, who's to say that that will happen after that result at Ross County? Are you a Rangers or Celtic then, fan? Uh, they would be just one point uh, behind Celtic. Uh, that is the sort of question you don't ask anyone in <laughs> broadcasting from the west of Scotland. But my father supported Rangers. He used to take me to Rangers games. But then, a few weeks later, he would take me to Celtic as well. And I would go to the likes of oh, Jimmy so Johnson, the reason Tommy you're Gemmell, not Tommy... Uh, the reason Marvel. you're not saying anything is because you're trying to keep everybody on side, Jim White, yeah? It's all about impartiality, of course. Of but course. Uh, No, sure. I mean, everybody thinks you're one thing. I think yeah. many Celtic fans feel, oh, he's supporting. Rangers. But really, in truth, 
Not so. Um, the Masters, did you stay up and watch it or did you guys bunk down because no, no. you've got to get to your bed? You've got to get up early, you see. Otherwise, I definitely would have watched every single second. Ten to one. Ten to one. With Henry. Um, yeah. Oh, I thought that was a bet. I thought that was the betting odds or something. I will, tell you now, <laughs> as a, I, will, I will tell you now as a mad golfer, this young man is not as good as Tiger Woods, but he's a generational talent and he will rule Scotty Scheffler for a long, long time. Unbelievable. Yeah, he, he Unbelievable. looks very much in control of what he does. He looks very comfortable. I mean, I, you're right, actually. I mean, he won it four, he four clear at the end. So it's a comfortable win for him. And not only four, did he beat the rest... Third tournament win in four. Yeah, he, he beat the rest, but he beat the elements as well because it blew a gale on yes. certain days. And he's a guy who held his nerve, his composure. He said would, he would walk off if his wife went into labour. Uh, that didn't happen. There he is holding the trophy above his head at the end. You're right, Scotty Scheffler has now become the man to beat. Bit of a sad image with Tiger Woods uh, at the end because uh, he found it just too much for him uh, in the final day. Sweden's Ludwig Aberg was runner-up, which is a great moment for him. Great moment First for him. ever major, 23. This described actually by Luke Donner when he picked him for the Ryder Cup as a generational talent. First ever major, he's only been a pro 10 months, one of the European Tour, the American Tour, been in the Ryder Cup winning team, and that, Marvelous. second in he yeah. will definitely be a major winner. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they know all about him now. You mm. excel in that tournament, people remember it. And again, it just doesn't seem to happen for Rory. Uh, the, the, Too the, much the pressure. One, Do you the know major what? that I, he can't win. I genuinely think he's, he's, he's past it, and I know you're going to go, what? I, I don't think he will achieve what... I will then. What? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think he's going to be back to where he was. I don't think so. I think there's Seriously, too many, well, I think he's still knocking too the many door. good young golfers around now, mate. Can Maybe. I, there's not many sports stories that I know much about, Jim. I think we can both admit that. But oh, Wrexham. Wrexham. Tell us what happened at the weekend. Wrexham, quite amazing, owned by, as you know, Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, they, them of uh, Hollywood fame. But uh, they've done it before and now they've done it again. Back-to-back -back promotions, uh, up to League One now. I mean, it's quite incredible what they've done. It really put Wrexham back on the map. Uh, they're out of League Two, they're heading to League One, and who's to say they don't do it again? It would be quite unprecedented if, if they were to make it uh, another promotion next season. But sure, McElhenney and uh, Reynolds very much much doing things at that football club and now the players quite rightly uh, Nick are saying well you did it before we want it again take us to Vegas <laughs> that's what they uh, did of course that's last what they said they, they want to to Vegas and just to finish today uh, really important Jim uh, Liverpool will fall silent later to mark 35 years since the horrific Hillsborough disaster my friend yes that's right uh, at six minutes past three uh, the precise time uh, all these years of the, of the disaster 35 years on Liverpool will fall silent uh, uh, of course, to mark the, the to mark the events of Hillsborough, and it's a very very sad and poignant moment uh, for the football club and for everybody still involved. I don't know about you, Jeremy. I still remember it. I still remember watching the news that night, and I can't quite get my head around that it's 35 years ago. It's but it, um, the very marking of this day means so much to so many. It does, uh, and it's a very important and, 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 day. And, and, on so it and, and so it should do on most of You're absolutely right. There's those moments in you're too young, but there's a moment you look nine back old when it and you go, "How on earth was that allowed to happen?" You could see people just from the top being yes. crushed. And yeah. thank God football's changed. It took a long, long time for the blame to be apportioned. But yeah, Merseyside will unite today and quite it rightly will. so. It will. It will. And all those uh, who engage in tragedy chanting, I hope, remember that this is how you pay your respects today uh, and they will do just that, Jeremy. Well said, Jim. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Still you to so come much, Jim White. On the programme, my friends. Well, as Iran-Israeli tensions mount, we'll be speaking to leading security expert Professor Anthony Gleese about whether the UK has been pulled into a foreign conflict. Please do keep getting in touch. Your views and your opinions. Talk today at talk.tv. Text away at 7222. It's almost 8 o'clock. Come back in three minutes, because if you don't, we'll be here on our own. ta -ra. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Worm is it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today. With Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you, my friends. It's gone 8 o'clock. It's Monday, the 15th of April. You were taught today on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. The Middle East is on the brink after the Iranian drone and rocket attacks over the weekend. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron urges restraint and calls on Israel not to escalate. MPs returned from recess today with Rwanda back on the agenda. But ministers could now consider plans to send migrants to Costa Rica. And what's next for Port Talbot will be live in the South Wales town as it prepares for life without the steelworks. And it's pretty blustery out there this morning. Wind gusts already of 60 miles per hour. Rain clearing south followed by showers. All the details coming up shortly. Cheers, Joe. Well, now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, says Iran's attack on Israel was a failure and is urging Israel not to retaliate. G7 leaders condemned the weekend barrage of missiles and drones, saying they stand in full solidarity to Israel. And it's currently unclear how Benjamin Netanyahu plans to respond. But military analyst Sean Bell has told Talk Today it all stems back to Israel's actions. You can't actually start the, with the context of the weekend without going back to the 1st of April. When um, Israelis attacked that uh, consulate building, Iran said almost immediately after the attack, that's it, we've, um, we've retaliated from, the, uh, from your attack on the 1st of April, we're drawing a line under it. The question is whether that line has also been drawn by Israel. Investigations into the Sydney knife attacker are looking at whether he deliberately targeted women. Five of the six people killed by Joel Kalchi were female and uh, the other was a security guard who tried to intervene. His family say he had a history of mental health problems. Well, speaking from Sydney, journalist Sophie Ellsworth told Talk Today the whole country's on edge. 
you'd like to think Australia is a very safe country. Uh, you know, a lot of people are proud of this country for being such a safe uh, place to live, but this has put a lot of doubt in people's minds and questioning whether it is safe. Donald Trump will enter a New York court later on, making him the first U.S. former president in history to stand trial in a criminal case. The 77-year-old is accused of falsifying business records to disguise hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. He could face up to four years in jail if convicted Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty. And we've got red sauce and brown sauce, but how would you feel about pink sauce? Mattel, the Barbie creator, has teamed up with Heinz to produce a limited edition barbecue mayo, a vegan sauce made with beetroot extracts. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines in an hour's time. Do you know what? To be fair, that sounds delicious. Delicious, but I hate right? how there's a Barbie everything now. Barbie oh, is... good, good. Six months of sense. Well, I love the film. I think the film's fantastic. The film's okay. rubbish. He's What's not the... seen it, what? No, so I don't want to see how would he know? Hold on a second. Ketchup and brown sauce. Now we've got what? Barbecue. Pink barbecue. Anybody who wants to have processed beetroot sauce on anything needs to go and live some... It's ridiculous. What... Look at it. I'm going to try it. Of course I'll you are, it. yeah. It sounds great. Very healthy. Really? <laughs> well, it's beetroot, isn't it? You're going to try it? Do you like beetroot? I love beetroot. Rubbish. You like chips. What are you talking about? I like chi chips and beetroot. <laughs> so you're going to try this. Mike Beckham, floor manager, is never here. Are you going to try pink sauce? I'll try it. I'll give try it, it. He said in his famous Australian Let's try and get it in no. for the show tomorrow. No, let's run it on a donut or something. It's all Barbie mad. It let's is. Let's get a man sauce in. What colour would a man uh, what sauce? What would Ken sauce be? It'd That's be blue. Sort of yeah, it'd be it bit be of blue. blue. bit of blue. <laughs> uh, right, listen, talk today at talk.tv. Text to 87 Do please uh, get in touch. Whatever you want to talk about, there is, uh, as you know... Um, some pretty appalling news out and about there today. We can't dress that, dress that up in any other way. We'll talk about the Middle East in a moment. Those horrendous stabbings over the weekend in Sydney. Mm -hmm. uh, six people uh, murdered in broad daylight by a madman running a, a mock with a, a knife. That's uh, caused a debate in Australia. He had mental health illness. Should more have been done for him? And, and it shines a light, I think, on the world as well. We'll also talk about Israel and those Iranian drone attacks. Talk today at talk.tv and text to 8722. Want to hear from you. Well, on to our top story today. And the Israeli war cabinet has decided that there will be a military response to the Iranian attack over the weekend. Iran fired more than 330 missiles and drones drones at Israel, but almost all of them were intercepted. This has led to international leaders calling for a de-escalation of tensions in the region, including Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron. Here's what the head of the UN had to say during a meeting over the weekend with the Security Council. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Well, joining us now is security expert from the University of Buckingham, uh, Professor Anthony Gleese. Good morning, Anthony. And uh, was this a Good warning? Morning. Good morning. Do you think this was a warning shot for, uh, from Iran to Israel, or do you think we're going to see further attacks? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, well, I, I, I honestly think when the Secretary General of the United Nations say we're on the brink of a much wider war in the Middle East, that has to be taken very seriously. When our Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, tells the Israelis Iran has not only lost once, it has lost twice, he's also trying to tell the Israelis something. The Israelis, however, say they are going to retaliate. So... We're in a situation of not just a tit-for-tat fight, first of all, between Iran, it, its, its surrogates, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah and the Houthis. They've been doing this for, for months now. But most recently, of course, Iran itself. So it's not just tit-for-tat, it's an escalating tit-for-tat. And the Israelis have made it clear that the... Um, 300 drone cruise missile attack, luckily thwarted, thwarted by the United States of America and the UK and France, mm -hmm. not just by the Israelis, that that is not the last word on the subject and they're not going to let Iran feel that they've got one over Israel. So escalating tit for tats, more and more people being brought in and many people will be saying, I think in Israel, in, in that war cabinet, uh, that escalation means another Israeli attack on 
Iran, maybe its nuclear facilities, uh, launch sites for the drones, whatever. And that spells disaster. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you so much indeed for coming on. Can I just look at it from the point of view of Benjamin Netanyahu here? Um, in the recent... Um, well, in recent weeks, certainly in the last couple of weeks, there seems to have been uh, some criticism inside Israel. People have looked at what's happening in Gaza and understandably are saying, what's your strategy? We know that he's a, a leader that's only leading in terms of war. There is much criticism, and, and, and if he isn't at war, that many people have been saying to us he wouldn't be in power. I don't want to disrespect what happened at all, but presumably the attacks on Israeli soil didn't take any lives, but on Israeli soil, merely strengthens his position, does it not, in terms of the view of the Israeli people, because he can use that and beat a drum and say, quite understandably, we're being attacked in our homeland. I mean, that's a fact, isn't it? Well, it is a fact. I mean, it is, it is a fact that it was on his watch that Hamas launched its murderous jihadist attack of the 7th of October. That, in a sense, is what started this war. And... He was in charge. It was his job to keep his people safe. And everything he's done actually has not kept his people safe. It has made Israel less secure, not more secure. But his war of mighty vengeance, as he's called it, has not only killed uh, uh, far too many civilians in Gaza, 30,000 plus, we, we believe, and, and maimed a generation of children, but it has not made Israel safer. That's the point. Now, were the Israelis traumatised by what happened on the 7th of October, the largest single massacre of Jews since the Second World War? Of course they were. Does this bind them to their government? Of course it does. Uh, do they stand behind Netanyahu whilst Israel is at war? They will inevitably do so, even if he hasn't brought the hostages over. Indeed, we must fear that most of the hostages are now dead in any case. So the Israelis have lost a huge amount, yet this great fear they have of being wiped out. And both Iran and its surrogate Hamas are committed to the destruction of Israel. Uh, what they mean by from the uh, river to the sea is the destruction of Israel. So I think we're in a situation where the Israeli people, they support the war. They don't see the pictures that we see here in the West. They see that the Iranian attack was repelled, and that I think they are probably terrified of a second attack. And we shouldn't forget, this attack was repelled, but the Iranians now know how we are able to repel. But can I, can, I, can I just jump in? The reason that I went down that tack, Anthony, and it's so good to have you on, is that, and I would never demean something, but one got the distinct impression that that attack on the embassy in Damascus that killed 13 people was always going to be met with retribution, which Iran has done. When I say tit for tat and point scoring, presumably Iran needed to show Hamas it was standing shoulder to shoulder, but now they've said, we're done. Israel can say to its people, we're being attacked, and maybe... And, and that's what happens. It's a lot of posturing, isn't it? But as, every, as everybody knows... People will posture and the rest of the world will sit and bite its fingernails. I've been accused of talking about this for months with Tobias Elwood and people like that. Oh, you're warmongering. I think we're in a really dangerous position for this world, aren't we? Abs I couldn't agree with you. And I said for the word go and people have been kind enough to ask me. We are on the brink of a, a wider war because each tit for tat is worse than the previous tit for tat. And Netanyahu uh, undoubtedly feels that in his heart, responsible for what happened on the 7th of October. And people will be whispering in his ear and, and there will be a lot of noise coming from the United States of America. Look, you've, we have repelled the Iranian attack. Now they are weak. Let's finish the job. Let's go in there and finish the job and get rid of the Ayatollahs for once and for all. And, and that's a powerful message. You know, as the Israeli Prime Minister once said, it, if the Arabs give up their weapons, we have peace in the Middle East. If the Israelis give up their weapons, Israel is destroyed. And that message is very convincing. I think Netanyahu is himself convinced, but it is not the way forward. That is the point. It is not the way forward. Everything that Netanyahu has done to escalate this, whether it's giving guns to settlers who are seizing land from Arabs in the West Bank, 
whether it is this war of mighty vengeance in Gaza that has not achieved any of its objectives, whether it is the threat to wipe out Rafa, which remains very important. Netanyahu feels his future depends on being the person that uh, carries out a policy of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But as I say, it's more than that. It's, it's two eyes for one eye, it's two teeth for one tooth. And it can only, that can only logically end in catastrophe, catastrophe for the people of Israel, catastrophe for the Arabs. And who knows, we can be pulled into it. The drones that Iran fired at Israel were the same drones that Putin is using to try yep. to destroy Ukraine. And that's all going on at the moment because Putin is rubbing his hands with glee, noticing that uh, the world's attention, quite properly, is more focused now on the Middle East. Where this leads to, if Netanyahu does not draw a line under it, I think is an extremely dark place that will affect us all. Again, as, as Rishi Sunak said last night, this also has repercussions on us here in the United Kingdom, on our terrorism threat levels, on what Iranians are able to do in the United Kingdom to attack us because we're supporting Israel. Well, thank you yeah, so thanks. much for your insight there, um, Professor Anthony Gleese. I could listen to him all day. Fascinating. Just totally balanced and, and sense. Thank you, Anthony. Really good to hear from you. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now, all covering the top story. Nick and I have been concentrating on the Times. Israel vowing revenge after Iran's airstrike, but world leaders insist on calm in the Middle East. Step back from the brink, says the mirror, as Iran is warned by leaders of the G7 that its attack on Israel has put the region on the brink of war. And it's time the world faces evil. The evil empire in Tehran, writes the Mail, as President Joe Biden blocks an instant retaliation from Israel. Well, yesterday, Rishi Sunak expressed the UK's intention for full solidarity amidst the ongoing tensions between Israel and Iran. Here's a reminder of what he said. Thanks to an international coordinated effort, which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel, but in neighbouring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect civilians. Well, joining us now is a Mail on Sunday's Anna Mihailova. Anna, good morning. We heard from Rishi Sunak there. Now, MPs return from recess today. Will the conflict be a significant topic in the Commons today? Absolutely. I mean, you, you can expect um, uh, the Prime Minister to probably make a statement to the Commons today. Um, David Cameron's out and about this morning on a broadcast round. And, and then, of course, behind the scenes, there'll be a lot of diplomacy going on because the UK plays a key role in trying to prevent escalation, further escalation. Uh, I'm gutted you're not here today, actually, but thank you for coming on. Um, you know this whole, we were talking about it, brink of World War Three chat that's going on. Um, and we sort of dissected this in the last two and a half hours and everybody seems to have a theory, don't they? You know, for for Israel, you could argue, as I just did with with Anthony Gleese, that, that this suits Netanyahu, the fact that these drones, some landed in his territory. It suits Hamas. I'm guessing that Iran showed solidarity by launching the, the similar things. You've got Joe Biden in the States, apparently now, you know, proving that he's a strong statesman whilst Trump's in court. Do you believe the people who say that the world's on the brink or do you believe that that's warmongering? What's your take on this? I, I, I think there has to be readiness. Um, I mean, the, the phrase that keeps being used by senior politicians here is we're in a pre-war state, uh, which when I first heard that, I was quite sceptical. But at the end of the day, um, you do have to have preparations um, involved because... The risk with world with a world war conflict, if you look at history, if you look at any big conflict, um, it's often not the designed steps that were taken. It's some kind of misfire. So it's a miscal. The, the, the greatest risk is a mis miscalculation on one side or the other. Um, you can tell from Iran 
uh, from this weekend, the way that they they said they gave 72 hours notice, they sort of almost made a point of trying to make clear that they were retaliating, but only to be seen to be retaliating. A box ticking uh, exercise, that's what I mean. And there's the danger yeah, that it becomes uh, tit for tat and then somebody does something that they shouldn't yes, have done. And, yeah. and someone presses a button that they shouldn't have or goes too fast and then you get a massive um, escalation. And that is absolutely a huge, huge concern because the Middle East, you know, it's been described many things, but tinderbox is one phrase. Um, it, it, it's uh, There are so many people so engaged and so, um, I mean, passionate, I guess is one word, um, uh, riled up is another. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the opportunity for misfire and miscalculation is huge, which is why there's, a, there's an absolutely enormous space for diplomacy here and trying to get cool heads in the room. Well, Lord Cameron, uh, our Foreign Secretary, was speaking to our sister station, Times Radio, this morning. He was very much focusing on Israel and suggesting that actually what happened over the weekend, the fact that a minimal number of, of missiles actually ended up hitting Israeli soil, obviously extremely sad that a young girl uh, had been taken to hospital with injuries, but there were no deaths as a result. Cameron saying that actually Israel should see this as a win because they were successful in defending themselves against Iran and that any further retaliatory strike would be escalatory. I mean, I think that message that he's giving publicly, I'm not sure how effective it actually will be, but I mean, in terms of just analysing it, it, it has been a win in a different sense because I think it has reminded the world that Israel is a country surrounded by countries that have a stated aim of wiping Israel off the map. So in that respect, in, in terms of where global opinion has been um, uh, uh, following um, well, the Gaza conflict, I think that that is going to be helpful um, in, in, re, in re, recalibrating how people look at Israel and how people look at the region once again. It'll certainly make fewer MPs um, call for stopping arming, you know, uh, stopping the UK arming Israel. Um, it'll certainly have a gear shift in that respect. But I mean, David Cameron's role here is interesting because he's sort of recently traveled to the US, basically lecturing the United States um, over oh, Ukraine. I'm so and glad you said this because I can't have this bloke at all. He did a 20, he did a 360 degree turn the other week when he was saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't sell arms. And the next day when Biden said we stand next to you in a dogfight, he said the same. I get the distinct impression that he's now the voice of the British government. I see nothing. He soon I did that. But I, I, I'm, I'm sort of with you on that. He seems to be lecturing people a bit. To be fair, yeah, and when and when and as as we all know, people who lecture do not then have a great amount of um, success in trying to persuade people to do what they actually want. Um, uh, so it's 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 probably a counterproductive strategy to put it to put it diplomatically. Um, uh, Anna, very quickly, because um, I've I've worked out how to say your surname, which I'll do at the end, but. Angela Rayner, it ain't going away, is it? We were talking about this earlier. It's patently obvious to many of us here. Anyway, just tell the... We're not saying you're not telling the truth, but why don't you release the papers? Because they are not going to let this go, are they? Um, I mean, well, obviously, the police is now involved. Um, we've got people coming out, and I, I think, in, on, um, in my paper yesterday, uh, there, was a, there was a story about a former aide of Angela Reynolds who says, mm -hmm. no, she's absolutely not telling the truth about where she was living at the time. So, yes, th of course, there's, there's going to be more and more pressure. I mean, she has now said, she has now sort of staked her political career on a criminal um, conviction, um, a criminal charge, but that's not that's not really. I don't think that will help it go away either. And I think the biggest problem is we're in a run up to a local, a very important local election campaign, and then a, a following even more important general election campaign. And she's just not going to be out and about uh, as much. This is this is a thing because every time she goes out, until she clarifies and releases the papers, she says she has. She's just not Do really. You agree you know, with me that it suits. It, sorry, God, it no, suits just, Starmer a bit. I think. Do you think? I, I think, think it, so. I think it does and it doesn't. I think in some ways, certainly, it takes a shine off for a bit. And it, 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 it but, but she is. She, he also does need her for the unions, for mm. certain wings, mm. of Labour that, um, that give him, that, that, that give her huge support, and that don't necessarily resonate with him. What can we? What can you say about the detail of the language that Angela Rayner has used? We know that she's denied any wrongdoing, but she said, "I, I need to know the quote really." That, that if she has been found to, broke, to have broken the law, or is it if she faces criminal charges 
that she will yeah, step that's down. Because there's a, there's a big difference there, because I believe um, the sort of thing that she's been accused of that she denies, you would have to bring that charge within, I think it's 18 months. No, no, but I, I think when, when Anna talks about staking a political career, I think it's going to be very difficult for her if she's been proven to, to have lied. I don't... Listen, if she says that she's standing by the truth, I just don't understand why she doesn't let the papers out and get it done and get it nailed and get it put away. That has to, that has to make you think, hmm, that's a bit dodgy. This could have gone away three months ago. Anna? Well, I just think, uh, I mean, uh, to answer your question, Nicola, I think you're right um, uh, that that is the language she's used. I, I think one of the reasons the story is, you know, the thing she said, it, it gets quite knotty, it gets quite complicated, and then that roads trust um, with people. If you don't have a straightforward answer and a straightforward explanation, then then you run into trouble because people say, well, hold on, why aren't you being up front here? Why aren't you um, uh, saying what really happened? But I think a lot of this is going to be you know, later dissected as an example of how not to manage the press, frankly. Um, I think she's just made several, and, 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 her, and, and the people around her have made several mistakes in terms of just handling this story from the beginning. Well, thank you so much for joining us, as ever, Anna Mihailova from the Mail on can Sunday. I, can I just... I, you know, you've got a sense of humour, haven't you? They always say, I can't say your name. I've worked it out. It's Anna Mikhail Lover. Uh, oh. <laughs> Mihailova. <laughs> Thank Do you, not you prefer so, that, Anna. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. I and love I can her. only apologise. Uh, thank you. Jeremy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We love her. Still to come on Talk Today, a social media ban for under 16s will be proposed by the government within weeks. And we feel most stressed out at 8 15. It's the moment that it all gets too much, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> You're 10 minutes late. Crackle. Well, Ava Santina from Politics Show and the spectators, Freddie Gray, take us through the papers Lost next. Do stay with us. It's 8 20. Hopefully both of us will be back after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to abandon and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you're> like, <laughs> for yeah. minutes, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 8.26. Now we'll have the weather in just a moment with Joe, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. A social media ban for under-16s is expected to be proposed by the government. Um, how the hell's that going to work? We'll talk about that in the papers next. And then we'll be live in Port Albert at 8.40. Oh, lovely, is it? As the town prepares for life without the steelworks. That was Welsh. Thank you. Do a bit of Welsh, because I can't do it, because I always end up sounding different. <laughs> but after locals in Kent complain about an almost six-fold increase to parking charges, at 9.20 we'll tell them to come to London and work out why it happens elsewhere. But first, Joe, what is the weather looking like later today? It was Joe. a beautiful weekend. Are we going to have more of the same? Uh, sadly not. No. 21.8 Celsius no, it was really. over the weekend. It's going to be sunny next weekend. And next weekend is looking good. Why Actually, do sorry, that? That high really pressure settled things down, but it could be a bit of a cloudy high. Oh. What, next weekend? Uh, yes. As long we as it's not wet, I can get on the golf course. Cloudy high sounds great. Yep. Don't start okay. you. We're not getting high at all. <laughs> we'll be watching that one throughout the week, but certainly things are set to improve. Meanwhile, if you've been outside this morning, it's cold and, gosh, it's windy as well. Let's take a look at the details. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, there have been wind gusts of 60 miles per hour this morning already, and the showers that follow the rain that's clearing southwards are likely to bring with them some gusty winds as well. And certainly it's a chilly start to the day. Temperatures in uh, low single figures, sub-zero for parts of Scotland, and as I say, high pressure building in the west. So having an increasing influence as we go through the week with the chance of things being a little more settled come the weekend, even though we could still see quite a bit of cloud. Now this morning we've been watching this narrow band of squally rain working its way southwards. It will be crossing the capital very shortly, and then by the middle of the day, clearing away to the near continent. And with that, we're going to see those very strong and gusty winds. And what it leaves behind, sunny spells and showers. Now, those showers turning wintry over the higher ground, six to 800 metres, affecting parts of Scotland, the Pennines, also parts of North Wales as well. Elsewhere, those showers could be heavy, could have the odd rumble of thunder as well. But as I say, those gusty winds, certainly something to mention. Now, temperatures at best, probably around 13, 14 degrees Celsius. We could just squeeze a degree or two more, but uh, certainly nothing spectacular, but about average for the time of year. So sunshine and showers continuing to the end of the day. Later on, those showers become more confined to the north and the west. And then that low centre tracks its way down those eastern coasts. So staying rather cloudy out there in the east with some showers or longer spells of rain at times, and it stays windy there as well. Meanwhile, inland, uh, things become drier and clearer, and certainly through the course of Tuesday. We just used to see reasonable sunshine through parts of Wales and the Midlands, showers still following into parts of the north and the west. And it is going to stay quite cold here with those showers staying wintry up over the high ground. So, in essence, another day of sunny spells and showers, but it's out towards those eastern areas where it's going to stay pretty grey for parts of Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, parts of East Anglia and the southeast with some further outbreaks of rain. And again, temperatures reaching the low to mid teens. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Joe Wright, the final look through this morning's papers with an upbeat over Santina from Politics Joe and the Spectators, Freddie Gray. Hello. Hi. Once again, good. Uh, Freddie, <laughs> um, right, I'm, I'm missing number two. In the sun, um, page six. Over 250 survivors and relatives say MI5 breached the Human Rights Act by failing to intervene before Salman Abidi uh, killed 22 people in 2017. Yes. This, if you look at what's happening in Sydney and yeah. you look about uh, increasingly across the world, there seem to be these crazy knife attacks and then you have stories about these people got mental illness and they should have been in hospital. What's, what, what's this story? It's the same sort of story. People are more aware of this, right? Well, the idea here is... I mean, often with terrorist attacks, we hear that they were on the radar of the security services. Oh. And with Salman Abedi, they did have quite good intelligence. He'd just come back from Syria. Uh, there were several warnings about him which were not acted on. Um, and so that's what these victims are suing over. They're saying, you know, you breached our Human Rights Act by not intervening to save us. I think this is quite a dangerous precedent. I mean, right, yeah. e everybody likes to sort of be down on the security service, but the fact is they're constantly monitoring thousands of people. Uh, and this idea that they have some duty, a legal duty to protect from terrorism, which they can't be, you can't expect... Are them they to do doing it. a good enough job, though? I mean, obviously, the difference between... And we well, should make this point between what happened in Sydney... This is not a terrorist attack. This was somebody who obviously has mental health issues and has attacked yes. and killed five women, women and a man. Yeah. However, this, this Salman Abidi... People will say, 
Hold on a minute. If he was on the radar, he should have been dealt with. He, he, should, have been been, he should have been either incarcerated or deported or whatever. That's a perfectly justifiable comment. But then what the security services will say is that you, you have no idea how many of these we're dealing with at any one time sure. and how many threats, we, how many real threats we've actually stopped yeah. that you just so never they... hear about because yeah. they got stopped. Uh, so I do think it's a dangerous precedent to, to sue the security services over... And what, what kind of law are they suing over? What, Human Rights Act. Human what, rights bre Act. What, what breach of it? Just the failure to intervene? The failure to intervene to save their lives, which does sound like an, a, an odd case. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think probably for the best that, it, that they don't get paid out, although, of course, we all feel very sorry for them because they've suffered terribly. Of course, this is, you know, all the, the, so many uh, victims of the, the Manchester Can bombing. Can I skip the Chinese? Is it all right? I have one last night. It's repeated on me. Oh, my God. Jeremy. Chinese meal last night. Jeremy. Repeated on me. I, I want to skip that story because I had a Chinese last night. It's, it's, I want to go to the one if I can. Jeremy. A social media ban for under 16. How is anybody honestly thinking this is going to happen? Um, uh, well, well, it's, it's quite plausible, actually. You know, uh, oh. <laughs> if you push it through. But no, I mean, but come on. But, you know, under 16s are going to get Where do you stand media, on this, Ava? Yeah, do you think it's, it's actually practical? Well, no, it's, it's totally the wrong approach. And it's, it's MP... Well, sorry, not MPs. It's actually... It's DCMS who are too frightened to stand up to tech companies. And it should really be the job of them and number 10 to be coordinating a plan with them, to be mm -hmm. using the mm -hmm. algorithm that blocks certain content from reaching certain age groups. Like, I mean... Whenever you use social media, it's creating a log about you and it knows more about you than actually you know about yourself. Yep. Um, so the, the quite simple argument is if you would like to protect children from certain content, they must feel obligated to do it. But, you know, for the past five, six years, I think conversation and communication has completely broke down between uh, Meta, X and the government. And we basically just said, look, it's lovely that you'd like to employ people here and you'd like to operate out of uh, out of London. So we'll, we'll we'll let you continue to do that without any repercussions, and that's ridiculous. I'm a terrible hypocrite about this because I'm a very anti the smoking ban. I think that's a, a breach of liberty and so on. But when it comes to social media, I'm I'm a complete reactionary authoritarian. Really, I think get them away from children as fast as possible. But how do you how, how do, do you, you do seriously it? legislate? And, and I'm with Ava, well, actually. You can't, I mean, we block... Do we not need to have more control over these big tech organisations who are but, making billions of pounds and are running amok? Surely. But, I mean, Ava's right. Well, we can, we can block... I mean, we block children from gambling, we block them from looking at pornography to a large extent. Mm. Uh, but there it, aren't it can good, be done. There, there aren't good bets that you can place. There's arguably no good pornography, if you yeah. understand my point, but there well, is good if you're a social... Child. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Um, there, are, there is a positive to social media. They can benefit from using social media at the same time. It can be educational, it can... Mm. Uh, create social interactions that are positive. So it's just trying to work this out is what my... Good. How do we only allow exactly. them to get it's to the good bit? It's not as simple as other things that we've banned. Right. This is the argument my eldest son makes. He's 13 and we don't let him have a phone. Mm. And he's the only one in his class. I think your father's an absolute... No, I, listen, <laughs> I, I'm the worst type of parent because I say exactly the same and then my kids go on their iPads and it their It feels phones. like an easier get-out, doesn't it, to just ban something outright rather than to say, OK, How let's... I think well, the it's thing it's... is that a, a, lot of, a lot of parents are asking for help because it's so hard. But stop. how do you categorise, as you said? I mean, well, we have great. it in television, don't we? We have Ofcom rules. We have, you know, before nine o'clock, after nine o'clock. Whether we? whether or not someone's watching is a, a completely different thing. Ofcom. But there are. It'd be quite easy yeah. to limit, you know, say um, eating disorder content yeah. not being delivered to people who are well, actually shouldn't be delivered to anyone, but people who are under eighteen. That would yeah. be quite easy. Yeah. But, you know, the, I just find this so frustrating because it's like even the MPs are sort of putting this together and pushing it forward. Clearly, don't have that thorough of an understanding of social media because that would include WhatsApp. So what you're going to ban all under 16s from using WhatsApp. So that, that you know, but that's I sort of, just, but what I, also I mean get... is, is that, you know, in their eyes, they're basically portraying it as like, you know, it's either Pornhub or, or, or nothing. Yeah. And actually the answer is much more nuanced than that. Sure. You know, there's, you know, of, of course you can't ban an under 16 year old from using a messaging app like WhatsApp. You but can, you know, why aren't you, you Yeah, <laughs> why aren't you pushing Meta? I, I'm really interested in your solids, you know, I think you're right. But I mean, how do you, as a parent, how yeah. do you handle against what you believe that he's one, he's on his own in his class, mm. he can't be involved in that way because of your fear of what he will find on social media? I've said this before on the show, you've met Henry, they now get their homework on email and they get yeah. WhatsApps from their teachers saying, don't forget to be at cricket practice. For God's sake, we know... So, so the word has changed. Do you feel that in your guise of wanting to protect your son, you're actually holding him back? Uh, I, I, yeah, I think we probably... We, we don't really care about holding him back. 
I'm just interested. No, no, no I think well, we had a few weeks fair ago. Fair play, you've got an opinion on it. A few weeks ago, we had a, an email from the school saying there's been an incident of a, a, one of the groups, that WhatsApp groups that the boys are using. Yeah. Uh, there's been some child pornography on there. Awful, yeah. And Ferdy, my eldest, was particularly upset because he was like, now I'm never going to get a phone. Because yeah, like, this, yeah. this is played into the wrong... I thought you were going to say he was upset. Yeah, he never saw it. He never saw it. <laughs> Ava and I were both like... I started oh. sweating. <laughs> 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 oh <my God. laughs> Ava and I were both looking at each other then. <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's striking that balance between yeah, not wanting right. to completely shield children from something altogether so that when they turn 16 or 18, yeah. they yeah. desperately want to use but that's it. Like, yeah. that, but well, I, I understand yeah. as well. There's no education on that either. I mean, yeah. why aren't children being taught what is child pornography? Because I remember this was a huge... Yeah. Practical my, um... education, I will always agree yeah. with you. But when my sister usual... was at school, I mean, there was, a, there was a sudden huge rise of this child pornography being shared. And I remember like one, yeah. of, the, one of the school kids were told, you know, you, you could go to prison for this. And he had no idea. And I'm not saying that he was innocent or should be... In, you know, absolved. But the idea that you're not even teaching children yeah. that you can't you got me do on, that. You got me on something even that I feel it so on strongly your phone. about. I know maths, English, science, French. Do we not teach our kids anything that's practical in school nowadays? Mm. Seriously. CPR, social media, call me boring, call me whatever you want. We don't do that. And are they ready? They come out of school with eight GCSEs or a few A levels. Are they ready for life? No, they're not. But you're absolutely you, right about that, mate. How do you teach a child about child pornography? Well, you would, well I don't think you need to use an example. I do sex you could, education. You could include yeah, it in yeah. that. You could talk about what about broken families? What about there's all sorts but of things you, would you say could talk that the, to the kids. sharing of any images of somebody under the age of 18 yeah. is illegal. And even if you're found in possession of that, even if someone has sent it to your mobile and you haven't even opened it, yeah. that yeah. is against the law. And you should report it. Instantly. And you should report and it should immediately. Be like an amnesty, uh, amnesty system that you can go to someone at the school, say a teacher or someone like that, yeah. who you can report it to. And then yeah. it would be like a, you know, then it could be investigated straight away before it has a chance to spread. Um, Freddie, can we do this survey? Because I don't get this, Nick. What is this? 35% of completely. people in the morning, the most stressful moment is 8.15. Why what is that? that? Are you feeling stressed? Because it's about what time is it? What time is it now? Eight. Eight thirty-eight. Yeah, eight thirty-eight. Eight, 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 eight. eight. So, so you just, feel stressed every morning. You're just past <laughs> the most stressful period. Uh, apparently, it's to do with uh, running the school run and preparing for work. The combination yeah. of the two parents are. Very, very stressed. Right. These are people who go to work at nine o'clock. It's yeah, like no. three o'clock in the it's morning. It's about four in the afternoon for us yeah. right now. What are you yeah. talking about? Yeah. It's so much easier to go to work early, early, though. Do yes. you not think? Totally. I, think, I think it's much easier because you sort of just get up and you're there. No, no, you've no, done I your have day. to around my yeah. house to make sure I don't wake up anybody. It's like it's an absolute military operation to lay everything out the night before. The keys click, everything's a nightmare. Baby Do starts crying. you use the torch on your phone to kind of scramble yes. around? Oh, yeah. my yeah. God, I was putting my pants on this morning doing that very same thing. Well, with a, with what were you checking for? What? <laughs> that it was all there. That I, oh, well, it isn't, obviously. Now you've made a joke about testicular cancer, which is appalling. Fantastic. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Ava. Thank yeah. you Thanks. both, Ava and Freddie, for joining us <laughs> this morning. She's gone, my mate. She's gone. <laughs> it's okay. I've only got one testicle. Everybody knows. Thanks for bringing that up on breakfast for this one. Right. <laughs> there we go. Not that we like to go on a pass here. No. Well, what? you at home, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions this morning. We've obviously been talking about the top story story on the front pages of pretty much all, well, yeah, mm. all the newspapers today, that Iran attack on Israel. Are you worried that we're heading for World War III? Esther, 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 Estella. Estella. Yeah. The nations of the Middle East have crossed the line on several occasions, putting the globe on the brink of war. Israel bombed Iran's concert in Damascus, which killed top Iranian generals. Now the drone attack is retaliation. Israel needs to think of the consequences before poking the bear. Some would say you're right there. Some would say the bear needs poking. I don't know. I don't think there is an answer. Jack says, no, I totally disagree that we're heading for World War III. There are too many vested interests at stake. However, there's no doubt that the countries on both sides of the argument will exploit the turmoil. We were talking about Absolutely. that in the past hour. And Martin, we cannot go towards a world war unless world powers like the US and the UK get involved. I wouldn't call us a world power. So it will be much more advisable for our government to solve the domestic crisis first and not direct much attention and resources towards the Middle East. That, by the way, war fatigue and all that, for all the people who do get concerned about military, they do, they care about the cost of living. There's your problem. There's your issue. Listen, talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722. She's still looking mortified, Ava Santina. <laughs> I'm sweating. <laughs> well, we're going to move on now because this week questions will be raised in Parliament over the social impact of closing the Port Talbot steelworks. It comes after 1,500 workers based in Port Talbot voted in favour of strikes for the first time in more than 40 years. Well, joining us live from Port Talbot this morning is Talk Today correspondent Nick Ellaby. Nick, how have locals coped with the closure of these furnaces? Good morning. 
Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Jeremy. You know, the word I keep hearing here in Port Talbot and, and the area around here is devastating. People tell me that these furnaces closing down will be devastating not only for Port Talbot, but also for the surrounding area as well, because there are so many jobs that rely on these steelworks being in use. You can see these two blast furnaces behind me. They've been running for 70 years. There's been a steelworks here since 1953. So you're talking about most people around here have never seen this place not at full capacity. But the problem is, as I say, these two blast furnaces used in the steelmaking process just by themselves are creating 3% of the country's CO2 emissions. And the government and also the steel companies are trying to decarbonise the steelmaking process. The other problem is this place is running at a loss. So Tata Steel, the company that runs it, is going to change it to an electric arc furnace. Now the problem with that electric furnace is that it employs fewer people. They're talking about losing 2,800 jobs from this steelworks and then that will have a huge knock-on effect in Port Talbot and the wider community. There have been protests about it in Westminster and around here as to how it's been handled as well. But as I say, people telling me it could be devastating, not only for Port Talbot, but also this whole area of South Wales. We've been speaking to people in Port Talbot this morning about what would happen if these blast furnaces are shut down. Here's what they told me. Port Talbot, will, there will be nothing left of Port Talbot if it shuts down. How are people feeling at the moment? I think everybody's a bit shocked and a bit down um, and wondering what's going to happen next kind of thing, you know. I mean, things are expensive anyway and then losing your generation of job kind of thing um, here. And then the skyline just isn't going to be the same without those two things flashing at night and the flames coming up, which is quite incredible. So, yeah, first of all, what impact is the closure of the furnaces going to have on this area? It's going to have a big impact, I think, uh, the closure of the furnaces. You know, businesses, small businesses, they are going to be impacted, but... Everyone's just got to persevere, and I think we make it through in the long run. Like, do you know what I mean? Hard times, but this place is built on hard times, and it's, it's built strong people. So that last guy there talking about the impact on small businesses. We can get into that now. I've got Ben Cotton with me, who's the head of Wales for the Federation of Small Businesses. Ben, people here talking about for every job, you know, you can times it by four for contractors. We're talking about 1,300 jobs. What's the impact going to be for this area of South Wales? It could be significant. This is a huge economic ecosystem, and it's an ecosystem that draws in many, many businesses. So it's not just those, those employees at the plant that are, uh, that are affected, but the employees and business owners in the many, many small businesses that are within the supply chain, but also within the town. You know, you've got pubs, cafes, you've got shops in the town that depend on the thousands of people coming through the gate at Patal, but the future for them is very, very uncertain. And for many, as you say, they have known nothing different and they've grown their business around this site. So it's very uncertain, very difficult time for those. What's the feeling? What are people telling you about how they're feeling about it? Very uncertain. This has been months of speculation. It's a long, drawn-out process, and we're yet a long way from the final picture as to what's going to happen here at Port Albert. And in the meantime, there are decisions that businesses are having to make about their future. So it's deeply, deeply uncertain. And first and foremost, this is a personal story for many, many people. But it's also an economic story. So we need certainty for the businesses in the supply chain. We need certainty, as some description, for the businesses in the town as to what happens next. Next. You're talking about certainty. What kind of a plan are we looking at? What would you like to see happen here at the Steelworks? Well, obviously, we want to retain as much capacity within the site as possible. But we know that there are great there's great engineering expertise on site and in the skilled supply chain. So that can be used then for the next story about decarbonisation, which is things like the floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. That will require uh, engineering skill set. That will require innovation that we know exists at this site. So we need to accelerate those plans to make sure that businesses have something to go to next and that we start to tool up to make sure that there is a viability for this site and the skills that are dependent on it. Ben, thank you. Thank you so much. So, Ben Cottam, Head of Wales Federation of Small Businesses there, talking about new projects for this place, maybe looking into floating offshore wind. I mean, you know, renewable energies, wind farms, very, very steel hungry. And also, if you're talking about amping up production uh, and, and military defence spending, then the UK is going to need to be able to produce its own steel. If it's not going to be beholden to those price rises, 
bringing in steel from abroad. But here in South Wales, the area potentially could be devastated by the closure of these two blast furnaces behind me, guys. Uh, Nick, thank you very much indeed. Really interesting. Nick Ellaby from Port Talbot. They're just really discussing how, you know, if an area relies, you think of you think of Cornwall and tin mining, right? Yeah. Gone. You think of steelworks there. You think of Sheffield as well. It's 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 not great in many parts of the country. Thank you to Nick Ellaby. Still to come on talk today, my friends. Well, school exclusions are on the rise, but what does this mean for vulnerable children? We'll be speaking to a teacher with all the details next. And keep getting in touch with all your views and your opinions. Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8722. 12 12 minutes to nine o'clock. Where have you been? We're coming back in three. Thanks. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for, minute, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Friends, welcome back to Talk Today. What is it? Ten to nine. As schools return today after the Easter holidays, thank God. Research by Charity Chance UK shows that suspension rates for primary kids are at their highest level since 2006. It stated that children as young as five are being excluded and nearly all have special educational needs. Well, Johnny's in the studio is teaching Bobby Seagull. Bobby, um, I really appreciate you being on today, my friend. I've got a, a, a really strong opinion on this. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction what is this report, which in, in basic layman's terms, and what's your response to it? So Chance UK, a charity based in the UK, have been looking at expulsions among primary school children. And what they found is that um, one ninety-seven percent of children that are excluded at primary school level have a special educational need. Wow. And then 90% of these children that get expelled or suspended at primary school, they don't get maths or English GCSE. So this ends their life chances. And there's almost like a carousel. So these children, when they're young, there's some sort of classroom disruption then they get suspended or excluded. Then they sort of frequently move between different schools or 
uh, sort of pru units, um, pupil referral units, and ultimately they get poor educational outcomes. Um, I'm, I'm, I really have a personal story here which Nick yeah. knows about very, very quickly. Yeah. Ava, uh, born with severe dyslexia, probably took us too long daughter, to realise, my daughter. Yeah. And um, at eight years of age, I actually sat in a parents' evening when the woman said to me, and I won't name her, I will do one day, she said, <laughs> we don't hear much from Ava, so I just leave her at the back. And I made the decision, and I'm lucky enough to be able to do it, to put a girl who couldn't spell her name age day, and Ava's the same backwards as forwards. And, and eight years later, at a private school, hard graft, special education needs, she got eight GCSEs. I completely agree with you. Mm. There are too many kids with educational problems who are just become a statistic man. And people who are not lucky enough to be able to get their, their kid proper, like I could forever, it's a disgrace. Yes. Really strongly what about What kind it. of things are children as young as five being excluded for? So, usually with schools, it's physical acts. Like it could be like throwing chairs, scissors, mm. but the numbers are staggering. And in fact, I heard Sir Michael Wilshaw, he's uh, the former head of Austin, actually the former head of my state school as well. So he was a tough teacher, but tough love worked. Um, but he said uh, that part of the reason for this exclusions failure is that there's a power strength imbalance between local authorities and the CEOs of these multi-academy trusts. So yeah. back in 2010, and the data bears this out, that in 2010, 600 children were suspended, excluded from primary school. By 2018, it went up to 1,200, and now it's 22,000 children. That's because educa 20 to age that, six or under, they're That's because suspended. education beyond primary school is all about results. They don't care. It's about who gets what results. And in primary education, with all those reports, it's about making the children the school look good. That's appalling as well. And that's, that's what I say, because, again, 14 years, children are a little bit more difficult, but not, not from 600 to 22,000. So I think there's an issue here in terms of, like, local authorities yep. need to get more power back. I know in the, historically in the last 10, 15, 20 years, power's been moving away from... Was it been being more devolved? Do yeah, we, yeah, it's not... Yeah. Do it's we need more, more money for send children in schools, special education needs? So that's, that's what it is? Politics is all about making decisions and priorities. And I understand everyone's screaming for money, you know, healthcare, the military now, but education is so important. If we want to create a, a nation of young, educated citizens that are responsible, sensitive, compassionate, and productive for the UK, it starts in schools. And if we're having a situation where 22,000 children, age of six, are getting expelled, suspended, and again... On the back of the pandemic, where yeah, they didn't go to school uh, for two years, yeah? And there's so many knock-on effects, like their families, mm. their communities. And again, it's sad, because education is meant to be the thing that levels up society, not sure. levels down. And what happens to these children when they are excluded? Do they go to a different school, or are they just home-educated or left out of the system completely? So, so it's various systems. So initially, it's suspension, so it may be a couple of days, three, five days, and then an expulsion, mm -hmm. sometimes moved to another school. And how's a six-year-old going to take a suspension? It's hardly a, a punishment that they would really understand. Oh, they probably think, oh, time off holiday. Great, it's an yeah. extra weekend. And where so, are the parents and all this? Again, this is a tough one because I think that parents do take more responsibility. Quite right too, Bobby Seager. But also, when we're suspending and expelling this many children, it suggests that our threshold for expulsion is yep. too low. Yeah, yeah. So It's, it's frightening. It is indeed. And these outcomes for these children, as you say, don't look good. They don't end up getting maths, uh, GCSEs, English GCSEs. Mm. But then they also feel, I imagine, quite isolated from society as a whole. So then become yeah. potentially adults who don't necessarily integrate with society and, and don't contribute to it. My daughter won't mind me saying this until she was 12. She didn't talk to anybody. Someone came to the house, she went to a room and played yeah. in the playroom. Now, she made house captain. She, I, I can't even tell you. It just I'm makes so me want to cry. Because she was given a chance. Not blowing smoke up my, my backside. Mm. What I'm saying is there are people who can't do that for their kids and those kids will become a statistic and that is not fair. Do you think so often we do in society, not mm. just with tr children, but look at kind of behaviours like this that think that are antisocial, just really quickly, and we tell them off for being naughty rather than really looking at what's going on with them. Yeah, actually, I think that that's a, a bigger issue because children, they don't, they're not born naughty. No. They do things, they learn by trial and improvement. So I think it's that, again, ultimately, I think expulsions are not working. All they're doing is passing the buck onto someone else. But ultimately, society has to pay the price for that. You're a legend. You, you are, are and indeed. a West Ham fan. How do you feel a about West us Ham losing? Fan. To... Well, I'm going to the game on Thursday. We're playing Bayer Leverkusen. who won their first title in 120 years. Yes. We lost two of the first. And they've won 46 good. games on the bounce, and we lost to Fulham. <laughs> Bobby Seagull, you. you're Bobby Seagull, my hunted hero. Yes. Oh, you were on the telly together. We were. 
he did. Did you beat her? Yes, he did. But he very much beat me. He's wonderful. But thank you so much. You're wonderful too. Well, still to come on today's show, as Iran-Israeli tensions mount, we'll speak to the Sun's defence editor, Jerome Starkey, about whether the UK is being pulled into a foreign conflict. All of that coming up, your opinions and your views. Talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722. We'll start your message, please, with the word talk. It's almost nine. We've got our news headlines and we're coming back in three. Do join us. Thanks. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It's 9 o'clock on Monday, the 15th of April. Uh, you were talk today, my friends, on TV, on radio, of course, online on your smart speaker. And these are Monday morning's top stories. Now, the Middle East is on the brink after the Iranian drone and rocket attacks over the weekend. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron urges restraint and calls on Israel not to escalate. And joyous news. MPs returned from their recess today with Rwanda back on the agenda. But ministers could now consider sending migrants to Costa Rica. Wow. And after locals in Kent complain about a six-fold increase to parking charges, we'll be asking if the price to park is getting out of control. And torrential rain and strong gusty winds are spreading their way southeastwards through the day to be replaced by some equally potent showers, again with gusty winds. And it's feeling cold as well. All the weather details coming up very shortly. 
Cheers, Joe. Well, now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, says Iran's attack on Israel was a failure and is urging Israel not to retaliate. G7 leaders condemned the weekend barrage of missiles and drones, saying they stand in full solidarity to Israel. And it's currently unclear how Benjamin Netanyahu plans to respond. Well, former NATO commander Chris Parry's told Talk Today it could have caused catastrophic damage if the hundreds of missiles hadn't been intercepted. They were all designed to hit something. The fact they were brought down uh, is almost irrelevant. Uh, the intention was to kill uh, and also attack uh, lots of urban areas as well. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty heavy attack, even though it didn't succeed. Investigations into the Sydney knife attacker are looking at whether he deliberately targeted women. Five of the six people killed by Joel Couchy were female. The other was a security guard who tried to intervene. His family say he had a history of mental health problems. A minute's silence will take place in Liverpool later to mark 35 years since the Hillsborough disaster. 97 men, women and children died in a huge crowd crush at the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. The silence will be observed at 3.06 this afternoon, the time the match was stopped. A leading think tank says universal credit must change to meet the needs of an older and sicker population. According to the Resolution Foundation, 2.3 million people are now out of work because of poor health. That's nearly double since the benefit scheme was introduced 11 years ago. And Sunset Boulevard has dominated the Olivier Awards, winning seven of its 11 nominations. Leading duo Tom Francis and Nicole Scherzinger won the awards of Best Actor and Best Actress in a Musical. It's super overwhelming, um, but I'm so grateful and I'll probably after this tonight go home and cry <laughs> for a long time. You're up to date with the headlines. I'll have another update at 10 o'clock. Super overwhelming. Have so you, super have you overwhelming. Have you ever done a musical? Sorry? Have you ever done a musical? I thought you were going to see someone else then. No? I know. I met her boyfriend. He's as boring as anything. Oh, I'm my goodness. Wow. Tom wow. Evans has no conversation. I'm just being completely honest with you. Jeremy. No. Well, of course, Tom isn't here to defend himself. But um, I think you'd make a great Billy Flynn what does in that mean? Chicago. Oh, what does that mean? It's is Richard it? Gere's part in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, we could be Roxy Hart and Velma Kelly. Amazing. Get your tap shoes ready. I there can't dance. I've got a bad back. I'll tell you what I would like to be. I'd like to be Baron Hardup or whatever it is in, in, in Panto. What is in, it? Yes. Well, I Did can, I get that right? I can, it yeah, it is Baron Hardup. That's and then he's Cinderella's a... dad. What do you think? Do you think I could do Panto? Yes, I think so, Absolutely. Emily. Absolutely. You? You'd make a great villain. Ugly do you sister. Think so? What do you mean? Not yeah. suitable for buttons or anything. Why not? Characters. You're, you're not, as, not innocent enough, I what think. What do you see yourself as? Uh, Peter Pan would love to do that. I'd love to fly. Not the evil queen. Yeah, I'd, I'd make a good evil queen. Ever. I think so. <laughs> oh, stop it. So you're far too nice. Right, a little Thank bit lighthearted so relief. Much, Thanks, Em. Uh, back to that main news story as well. Can I just say, you yeah, have been writing. I just Can we do this very quickly? Absolutely. Because we did that part about exclusion from school. And I thought it was really interesting because loads of you responded. And now, uh, here we are. Just very quickly, we were talking before about this incredible rise on, on primary school kids being excluded from school. It's gone from, like, 600 to 22,000. Caitlin, people who don't work in the school system have no idea how violent some of these five-year-olds are. I taught a six-year-old who had racked up over 50 suspensions for violent behaviour, including injuring other kids. He smashed windows but he was because he was told no by a teacher. Schools are for education. It's time to stop protecting children that parents can't be bothered raising. Sick and tired of do-gooders with no idea of the reality of schools and teaching. That's interesting. So difficult, isn't it? Because yeah. you're absolutely right. No-one would want a violent no. child in their Starts child's class. Uh, Susan says, it depends if there's an alternative provided. Very good point. Yeah. School Schools can provide students with a behaviour management programme that can shape them for the future, but they cannot leave the kids on their own. Jodie, this is touched to nerve. Teaching assistants are bit spat at and punched by children as young as four or five. Many are not suitable for mainstream schools. None should have to take this abuse, and no matter what profession they are in or what age the accuser is. Really interesting. Please keep your thoughts coming. Talk today at talk.tv, text to 87 treble two. More of those ahead of 9.30, but back to our, new, our, our, not our top story in the news today. Well, the Israeli War Cabinet has decided that there will be a military response to the Iranian attack over the weekend. Iran fired more than 330 missiles and drones fired at Israel, but almost all of them were intercepted. This has led to international leaders calling for a de-escalation of tensions in the region, including our Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron. Here is what the head of the UN had to say during a meeting last night at the Security Council. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger 
of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. We're now delighted to be joined by Defence Editor for The Sun, good friend of the show, J Jerome Starkey. Good morning, um, Jerome, thank you. Um, rhetoric from all sides, international leaders saying, whoa, hold on a second, uh, you know, the, 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 the Iranian attempt failed, the drones were turned back, this dome of steel. I said this earlier, you're the expert, right? Um, it's all games now, isn't it? Does this strengthen Netanyahu with respect? Because he can now say to the Israeli people, they fired inside our territory. There are people saying that's why he did what he did in Damascus. You've got Biden strutting around the world, showing is he a strong leader or what? You've got Iran, who presumably took part in this to, to say to Hamas and the Houthis and Hezbollah, we're with you. Difficult times, difficult times. Well, Jeremy, I think one thing you're absolutely right on is that leaders are often playing to domestic audiences. And so that will explain why Tehran did what it did. And that may well also explain why, you know, the rhetoric in Israel uh, remains, you know, their right to self-defence. And that's being echoed by Israel's allies as well. We heard the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, today saying he supports, or at least he acknowledges, that Israel does have the right to self-defence. But he is urging restraint. Britain is urging restraint. The United States is urging restraint. I mean, let's be very clear. Nobody wants this to spiral no. into World War III. And that is ultimately what's at stake. Israel attacked uh, a consulate building, sovereign Iranian soil, uh, which elicited a huge response from Iran. But Iran clearly appears to have telegraphed its intentions in advance. And that allowed... Israel's allies to prepare what was a formidable defence. I mean, it's extraordinary. We've seen the Royal Air Force mm. uh, engage in the largest air-to-air -air engagement since the Falklands War, shooting down uh, those drones alongside US uh, and French allies. So the message from America, echoed again by Britain today, is take the win. You know, Israel has successfully defended itself. Tehran can, to its domestic audience, say, we have hit back. The world was on a knife edge. Let's try and step back from that knife edge and allow Israel to concentrate on its primary objective since October, which is uh, defeating Hamas. And the world also now trying to continue its pressure on Israel to allow that humanitarian aid in. Warnings today mm. from the UN that half a million people remaining on the brink of famine. I mean, it is catastrophic what has happened, you know, what is happening to civilians mm. inside Gaza. And what if Israel does retaliate? What does mm. that mean for the United Kingdom's relationship with mm. its ally? Well, if Israel retaliates, it depends on how and what they do. But the risk, of course, is this spirals. It becomes a tit for tat, an eye for an eye, until the whole world goes blind. And we are, you know, in that scenario where this could quickly escalate mm. into a regional conflict. You know, is Iran is already in league with Russia. Of course, Russia in Ukraine facing mm -hmm. off against NATO and the West's support. So it doesn't take too many dominoes to fall until this could potentially become a catastrophe, a global catastrophe. Worrying times. So there's Jerome, if you can, let's bring in the legend that is Sun columnist Rod Little. Uh, Rod, welcome. Monday, my favourite time of the day. Uh, so MPs, we're going to shoot through this lot, back from their long, long holiday today. The Middle East, I mean, Cameron's already been out and about this morning, having his say. What's your take on this, my friend? It's going to be central to them. What's your take on it? I think in the, uh, in the short term, I'm listening to what Jerome had to say, but in the short term, uh, and pragmatically, it's very, very good for Israel. There was a danger that Israel was becoming disconnected from all of its allies, which has never happened before properly, um, uh, not through any of the crises which, which Israel has suffered. Uh, but, but the attack from the Iranians has suddenly emboldened in the minds of not just the USA and, uh, and, uh, and the UK, but also uh, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, uh, all these countries which, which were part of the Abraham Accords, uh, all of those who find themselves on the side of Israel when it's up against the horror that is Iran. So it is, is, so it, so it is strengthened Israel's position uh, considerably, I think, in the short term. Um, we will see, because Netanyahu uh, is a volatile human being and it's not possible really to, to guess in advance what he will do. Um, 
were he to launch a, 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 an attack on Iran, I think that uh, we would still stay with him, basically. Uh, but, 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 but what it's done in the short term, it's made Israel's position a lot, lot more secure in terms of its relationships with the outside world uh, in a way which uh, it was terribly, terribly dwindling with the attacks uh, in Gaza and the, and the storming of Rafa, as, uh, as has been planned. Well, Rod, it won't just be uh, the conflict in the Middle East in MPs' inboxes this morning. The recess is over. Rwanda, oh, Rwanda, unbelievably, is back on the agenda, as is Costa Rica, incredibly. Yeah. Tell can us... I go, please? Well, can I tell I, you that I, on the drive-in this morning, go. Rod, on the drive-in this morning, what? I was half asleep, driving in this morning, sitting in the back seat, opened the Times, and it said Britain might try to send migrants to Costa. I didn't see Rica. Yeah. I thought they were going to send them to a coffee shop. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was quite. But if they're going to cost, it's been on my bucket list for ages. I can't <laughs> afford Costa Rica. Uh, it's just not on, is it? Uh, je suis Somalian. I want to go to Costa Rica. Um, I, I think it's. I, I think it's a. It's a huge problem for them. Uh, uh, the the policy of my party, incidentally, is to send them to Ascension Island. Uh, now that would be expensive. But the, the crucial thing and the thing which Costa Rica and the various other countries which are mentioned in there um, doesn't do is it takes it out of British control and therefore it, 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 it opens this huge field to the lawyers, the charities, all of whom wish to stop us sending people anywhere, no matter where it is. If you keep it within the British dominion, places that we own, uh, or uh, uh, places which are effectively part of Great Britain, then we have complete control over the process. And I think that's the problem which they ought to be wrestling with. Uh, and But I, I would say again, you know, any one of those countries which have been named in the papers this morning, I'd really like a break. They're warm, pleasant, and you don't have people like David Cameron. Oh, man, you're only on side where it's peeing down. We're only talking to me. Don't be so yeah. miserable. Right, uh, final yeah. thing before we bring Jerome back in. I want to see your face. You ready for this? Angela, it's not going away, is it? Why don't you just release the information and say, I've done nothing wrong because this cloak and dagger stuff, the press ain't going to leave her alone. I think, here's a theory for you, Roderick, right? Roderick, I reckon Starmer's Roderick. loving this, loving it, Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, this plays right into his hands. Thoughts? I think it probably does. Uh, I don't think they've handled it particularly well. I don't think there is very, very much that can be laid at Angela Rayner's door in terms of the, uh, the the supposed tax evasion. It's not tax evasion. At the very worst, it's about 3,000 quid, according to the New Statesman, which did a pretty forensic investigation of it, um, which may have been uh, uh, unpaid as a, as a consequence of, uh, of a mistake. It's, it's so minor. For me, the, the, as I've said this before, Jeremy, the thing... The thing which is which is the most important thing about this isn't how much money it is. It isn't whether she's defrauded people, which I don't think she has. It's that Labour thing again of, I'll do what I want to do, but I'll tell you what you can do. That's the important thing. The, the, the fact that she doesn't agree with council house sales and would stop council house sales, but would nonetheless buy her own council house and flog it off for a profit. That ties in with all the other stuff we've heard of people like Diane Abbott and uh, Shani Chakrabarti telling us we can't send our kids to private school, but doing so for their kids. Or for Emily Thornbury telling us that we can't send our kids to selective schools, but doing that for her kids. That's, that fits into, the, into a very powerful trope and people hate it. People hate that sort of hypocrisy. And I think that's far more important than you know, the, the sums of money or the idea that it was some kind of chicanery. Rod, and Jerome, oh, just coming to Rod, you for thank the... thank you, my friend. Thank you, Rod. Uh, coming to you for the final word there, back to our top story. Um, obviously, with everything that's happening in the Middle East at the moment, your defence editor. Should we be worried about what's happening right now? I think we should be concerned. Yeah. I think we should be concerned. The world is, is at a very fraught stage of international geopolitics. I mean, it's not just what's happening in the Middle East. I would you know, draw attention to what continues to be happening... Uh, in Ukraine, and, and the second we take our eyes off that, then that risks becoming even worse. And, you know, you can't forget the threat of what could 
happen in the Indo-Pacific and, of course, with China's ambitions for Taiwan. So it is a fraught time for the world and it's a fraught time for those who work in defence. And I'm sure we'll have you back in the next uh, coming Thanks, fortnight. Jerome. Thank you so much, Jerome Starkey and Rod Little from The Sun there. Well, still to come, a step to car. See what you did there. Villagers in Kent have been left furious after the feed Get over for it. local to London. car parks shot up from right. £2.20 to 15 quid. We'll be bringing you all the details next. 15 quid's not much, is it, to park your car? Coming back in a minute, just joking. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back. 20 past nine. Talk today. Kevin Alex from 9.30. Julia from 10. Now, drivers in Kent have been left furious after fees in a local car park jumped from £2.20 to 15 quid, marking what is understood to be a 580% increase, my friends. Well, locals claim that use of the car park has already dropped off and nearby businesses have been affected within days of the new charges being introduced. Joining us now, local resident Scott and Sadie Davis alongside President, this is brilliant, of the Car Park Appreciation Society, Kevin Beresford. Uh, Scott, Sadie, we ain't got long. What's happening? What's going on? Two, 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 two. Two pound mm. twenty to fifteen quid. It costs fifteen quid in London. You've got you've been having it too easy, my friends. Don't listen to him. Yeah, no, you're right. We, we have been having it easy because it was only one pound twenty. But <laughs> I mean, if they doubled it to two pound fifty, would have been okay. But fifteen pound. And it's affected local local business yeah, then, because obviously there's going to be a knock-on effect. Why have they raised it to fifteen pounds? Well, it's typical council. They're just robbing us like they do with everything. Oh, let's go to Kevin Beresford, president of the Car Park Appreciation Society. Bless your heart. I love that. Um, you're not responsible for putting this up. You're appalled on their behalf, aren't you? No, no, no. I mean, this is so unscrupulous, these people hiking that. I mean, 
it's it's almost unbelievable the amount that they've hiked, hiked it up, and it's just greed. Greed, that's what I call the money? it. Who gets the money, Kev? Who gets the money? Not us, that's for sure. But well, when, when somebody says you've had it good, well, they should have it good, in it? I mean, these car parks are meant to service the local community, mm. make them prosperous and, and must encourage us to go to the, the high street. Yeah. They should have it easy. I mean, Calm down, mate. You're going to have a cup. He's going to pass out in a minute. I completely agree with you, by the way. We've got a right of reply. You ready for this, you lot? At Canterbury Council, we accept that the change in approach to car park banding has resulted in an increase at School Lane. But we have confirmed to allow, continue to allow free parking for the morning school run and in the evening for events at the Hearn Centre. Residents are able to apply for an off-street residence permit, which offers good value for all year-round parking. Uh, blah, blah, blah. As with all parking charges, the situation will be reviewed next year when we will consider what we should do. Maybe they'll double it again. Well, but that's no good. That might, that might be good for residents or people who are nearby dropping kids off at school, but it's no good for visitors who'll no. be coming into the area. They're not going to visit. Bringing extra cash. Is that right, Scott and Sadie? Yes, it is. And what happens when they pick the kids up from school? They've got to pay the car parking yeah. charge then. So that's £1.90 every day for five days a week. Yeah. I think don't send your kids to school. Just, just don't tell... No, I'm joking. I think that's terrible. So don't overstep the mark, gentlemen in Worcester with a brummy accent. What, what should they do, these people? And please keep calm, my friend. What should they do? My blood boil, it really does. They should keep these prices down for, to, to service the community. I mean, Hern Bay, is a, it's a pretty seaside town, isn't it? You're going to get people from outside visit these car parks. There's no justification for that huge hike in prices. Mm -hmm. Good man. Can I just ask you, uh, Scott and Sadie, uh, gen genuinely, genuinely, Labour or Tory council? Couldn't care less. They're both the same. They just want the best job. Just the about sums up what most people think about politics nowadays, to be fair, <laughs> isn't it? The top executive gets 150000 a year. And this isn't Herne Bay, this is Herne Village. Yeah. We have 15,000 residents with one car park. He's right. Your wife hasn't said anything, man. Are you going to say anything, Sadie? That's my daughter. Yeah, that's yeah I was going to say. Okay. I was going to say it's quite clearly his daughter, Jeremy. Why? How do you, why is it clearly his daughter? Does he say? Judge, I, my wife. <laughs> Sadie, are, there, are you finding that people are using alternatives instead of using this car park with extortionate prices? Or are they just not paying? There's, there's no other alternatives. There's no other car park. There's nowhere else to park. Yeah. I took my business over in January. It's been thriving until the 1st of April. And there's just nowhere for anyone to park now. So it's just... All the roads are yellow line, double yellow. Yeah. You can't yeah, park in it. Absolutely. It's absolutely outrageous. I'm so glad we had you on. I'm sorry I thought that was your husband when it was your dad. That's not great, is it? That's another life. Well, yeah. Kevin, I just want you to get the last word. We've only got 10 seconds. What's your favourite car park in the UK? Oh, God. Well, at the moment, we voted Warwick University. Brilliant. Their car park. That's all the time I've got. You're very good. Yeah, like Warwick University, fantastic good. car Scott, park. Scott, Sadie, Kev, thank you. Stand by, Kevin, Alex, and next. Have a great day. Say goodbye. Goodbye. We'll be back at six tomorrow. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, it looks as though we'll see some more settled conditions at the end of the week, but for now it is cool and breezy. We've been watching this area of cloud and rain make its way through southeastern areas. It'll still be around for the next couple of hours, and if you get caught in it, we're looking at some torrential downpours and some very strong and gusty winds, gusts up to around 60 miles per hour. And even after it's disappeared, we'll see showers coming along that will be quite potent, turning wintry over the high ground. There could be the old rumble of thunder and some hail mixed in as well. And with those showers, again, some very gusty winds. So those showers stay with us through much of the night, most likely towards the northwest, and more persistent merging along those eastern coasts as the centre of low pressure moves away. So a pretty cloudy picture for eastern parts of Scotland, northeastern areas down into Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, and then that uh, cloud and rain lingering over parts of East Anglia and the southeast. And it will stay windy in these areas as well, right the way through Tuesday. Elsewhere, we'll see some sunshine coming through, particularly for these inland areas, out towards parts of Wales. A mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers once again for Ireland, and it will be quite chilly. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism in it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now 